Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Monday, September 24th, 2018. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, new accusers royal the Kavanaugh nomination as he preps his calendars. Meanwhile, Rod Rosenstein fired or resigned, or we don't know yet. On the Republican uh, justice... uh, (laughs) Senate Justice Committee, a staffer fired over past sexual harassment problems. Meanwhile, a right-wing operative on a leave of absence after a desperate pro-Kavanaugh conspiracy theory falls apart. Turns out it was a Raytheon lobbyist, now a top State Department advisor behind the Yemen war support over a $2 billion arms deal. Jeff Sessions has a new scheme to attack lawful immigrants. South Carolina besieged by floods following Hurricane Florence. Former Trump aide dosed his mistress with an abortion pill. That's nice. Allegedly. 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 Bill Cosby set for sentencing this week. doop a doop Three quarters of the overdose deaths in Ohio can now be attributed to fentanyl. And to round out your week, if we don't include uh, Saturday's deadline for the government to shut down, Donald Trump will be heading the U.N. Security Council this week. Enjoy. All this, and if you can believe it more, on today's program. Uh, Folks, obviously... um, Sort of an insane news day, weekend, ongoing. Um, The Kavanaugh hearings, I think as we uh, last left you on Friday, were still scheduled to be on Monday. By Friday afternoon, Ford and her uh, team was given till 10 p.m. Friday night to agree to show up on Monday, that was extended. And uh, so ultimately where we're at now is that Kavanaugh will be testifying and Ford will be testifying on Thursday. I believe there is a deal that is hammered out, although um, I don't know all of the details as of yet. We will get back to that. Subsequent to that, of course, there was a big story in The New Yorker about a second woman who had uh, accusations stemming from her time at Yale with Brett Kavanaugh. Subsequent or simultaneously, Michael Avenatti was claiming to have a client who had knowledge of some horrible sounding things that uh, Mike Judge or Mark Judge, the woman that Blasey Ford put in the room with Kavanaugh during high school, uh, Mark Judge was involved with, which was at the very least hinted at in the New Yorker story. We will talk about that uh, connection as well. People have a a bit of a um, jaundiced eye towards uh, Avenatti and I think that's a um, 
I think that's fairly uh, legitimate. I mean, we should be skeptical of, of all this stuff. At one point, though, uh, the preponderance of, of evidence becomes fairly uh, impressive. And then, of course, while that was happening, there were two other stories. One of a esteemed right-wing think tanker who had a blockbuster theory of a doppelganger. I mean, this is starting to sound like some type of parody that quickly fell apart. There is legitimate reason to question who was involved in trying to promote that story, which also libeled another individual. In addition, a key staffer on Chuck Grassley's team at the Senate Judiciary Committee turned out to have a sexual harassing past, and so he had to step down. And there's more, of course. Okay, so right now, Rod Rosenstein is headed to the White House. There have been multiple reports that Rod Rosenstein, who is the acting AG in terms of the massive russia investigation and the ma the russian investigation is expansive just a refresher the russian investigation existed before robert Mueller. it was perhaps at that time it was a um, i believe strictly a national security investigation the fbi was involved then, um, of course, Comey is fired. There may have been some pursuit of criminal of a, a criminal investigation at that point. Comey is fired. Sessions is recused. Rod Rosenstein um, oversees Mueller, who is appointed as the special counsel, and. Um, and so just to, to catch you up with that. So if Rod Rosenstein is uh, fired or, um, resigns now, my understanding is it is relevant, not just because of the optics of Donald Trump firing Rod Rosenstein and it making it look like he is, um, actively obstructing an investigation, but According to the Federal Vacancies Reform Act, Trump has the power to appoint an acting AG if it's a resignation. If, it's, if he's fired, it becomes a little bit more murky. Now, I don't know who stops that from happening, right? I mean, I guess you would go to the D.C. Circuit Court and maybe that would go up to the Supreme Court. It's unclear. I mean, that's when we talk about having a constitutional crisis. This is what we mean, that there is no clear way that this gets these things get resolved. There is also some question as to who would replace Rod Rosenstein. Broadly speaking, people say Francisco, um, this guy, Francisco, who is the uh, solicitor general. However, um, this. Francisco is um, a member of a law firm that apparently has some, at uh, Jones Day, that apparently has some connection to the Russian investigation. So Noel Francisco would probably have to be recused from the Russia investigation. Uh, Jones Day, which is his f former firm, I guess, represents the Trump campaign. <laughs> Francisco has recused himself in all Supreme Court cases. If it is not Francisco, who you should also know is a Federalist Society guy. It could go to Stephen Engel, who is the assistant attorney general for and heads the OLC. This is the office of... Um, this is the Office of Legal Counsel, which 
essentially functions as an arbiter for the president as to, you know, giving him legal advice. It's legal for you to do this. It's not legal for you to do this. This is where um, uh, Wu was, you know, saying torture is OK, et cetera, et cetera. Stephen Engel, um, also a Federalist Society, also a former clerk for Kaczynski, the federal judge who had to um, resign amid sexual harassment charges. So uh, the Federalist Society has done a pretty good job of inserting their folks into uh, government. Meanwhile, I said on uh, Chris Hayes' program, I don't know, a couple months ago, that Sean Hannity was now arguably one of the most important advisors to the president. Um, I took a little bit of grief for that. Here is Sean Hannity on his radio program on, I believe, September 11th. Mike in Detroit. Mike, hi, how are you? Hello, Sean. It's good to speak with you. I'm a long-time listener. I love your Fox show. I'm going to try to be real quick because i got a couple of quick questions, all right? Trump has got so many people in his corner ready to fight. Anything he can turn over or declassify, I can't understand why he wouldn't do it. What's he waiting for, one of his kids to get indicted or something? And if they do get a special counsel to look into the investigators, can it be stopped by the Democrats if they take the House and or Senate? And something else I thought about, if they're... For the investigation, the special counsel to begin with, there was supposed to be a crime uh, designated. If there's no crime designated, then can't Trump put an end to it? Yeah, I think... 30, 30 days. Name the crime or I'm putting an end to it. Put them on their heels. Listen, I think all of that's going to happen. I think it's going to happen sooner than later. I don't think it's going to happen on a week where 9-11 happened. Uh, it's uh, to me, there's other things that we are more important to talk about. And I don't think with a big, massive hurricane about to hit the east coast of the United States that looks like the real deal that that anybody's going to be focused on that. We've got to worry about our neighbors right now. We got to roll up our sleeves and be prepared to help out the people of South Carolina, North Carolina and uh, elsewhere. That's where our focus is. But afterwards, I would I would expect that he will do that. I mean, so he's he's getting pretty specific, right? We said we wouldn't do it on this week. But nobody calls Sean Hannity. <laughs> there you go. Um, like Chris Lepako's evil twin. Indeed. We will get um, more into the story that came out by the New York Times at the beginning of the weekend. That Ro- Rod Rosenstein, as the Times wrote it, sounded like he was involved in some type of cabal uh, to... Um, wiretap the president subsequent to that the stories uh, from uh, the Washington Post and others made it clear that this was uh, very dubious we will get into that in a moment then of course we will turn to everything that's going on with the Kavanaugh nomination which we may be just I I mean I don't know if I would bet that there's going to be a hearing on Thursday All that said, if you like the stories you hear on this show, um, we think you're going to like the Sierra Club's new storytelling podcast, The Land I Trust. Season two of The Land I Trust is out now. It brings you storytellers from across the Western U.S. who share their experiences in harvesting, protecting, and living with the four natural elements, water, fire, wind, and air. The series has 14 tales of individuals across the western part of the country as they share their tales of climate change, clean energy, and everything in between. Each year, the Sierra Club visits a different region of the country for a new set of stories. Season one, stories from the American South. They talk to musicians, families, farmers, and climate refugees, helping to move the South from coal ash pollution to a brighter, cleaner future. You can listen to The Land I Trust at beyondcoal.org slash stories. That's beyondcoal.org slash stories or on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, wherever you get your podcasts. Check out season two of The Land I Trust today. All right, so 
let's just go in and, and deal with this Rod Rosenstein first before we get to uh, more of the Kavanaugh stuff. So the Times came out with a story on Friday. I guess it was happening uh, mid-afternoon that Rod Rosenstein suggested that he secretly, this is the first lines of, the, uh, of this that he secretly record President Trump in the White House to expose the chaos consuming the administration. And he discussed recruiting cabinet members to invoke the 25th Amendment to remove Trump from office for being unfit. Now, the problem with this story, and it was amazing to me, the people who did not read this story carefully enough and actually thought that the sources they were getting for this Times piece was from the DOJ Or the FBI. But if you read the story carefully, you'll see that's not where they got their sources. Mr. Rose, and this is about four paragraphs down. And this was in the um, the days after the firing of Comey. And uh, the president divulging classified intelligence to the Russians in the Oval Office. Remember that one? Um, not Rosenstein, until you mentioned it actually right Rosenstein was two weeks into his job and um, Rosenstein was apparently upset when Trump had cited his memo as the reason why Comey was fired Mr. Rosenstein made these remarks about secretly recording Mr. Trump now remember what they said right they they characterized how, why Rod Rosenstein wanted, not only that he wanted to um, record President Trump, but as to why, to expose the chaos consuming the administration. He made the remarks about secretly recording Mr. Trump and about the 25th Amendment in meetings and conversations with other Justice Department and FBI officials. And then here's, Here's where you got to read carefully. Several people described the episodes in interviews over the past several months, insisting on anonymity to discuss the internal deliberations. Okay, so it sounds like they heard from people who were actually involved in those uh, discussions. But the people were briefed briefed either on the events themselves or on memos written by the FBI officials, including Andrew McCabe, that documented Mr. Rosenstein's actions or comments. So in other words, these people spoke to people who were there, and then those people spoke to the Times. Or they spoke to people who, who were not there, who simply read Andrew McCabe's memo. You see the problem here, right, is... Somewhere along the lines, having a first person's perspective on what was said and how it was said was absent from this story. And whoever the Times trusted to relate to them this information that existed clearly twisted it in a way that they wanted to. Because it comes out hours later, the Washington Post has spoken to someone who is actually there with Rod Rosenstein, and he actually turned to Andrew McCabe, who was there, and said, "So what, Andy? We're gonna we're gonna wire the president." Remember when Hillary and the whole bomb or drone Julian Assange thing happened? It was a similar sort of thing. Yeah, the words are there, but without the context of of what they are actually meaning. You could make this story sound like he was trying to wire the president when the reality is he's looking at someone saying, calm down, dude. What are you going to do? Wire the president? Not what are you going to do? Wire the president? Um, but this now, of course, whatever way you shake it, unfair. Well, this ends up being the premise under which why right now Rosenstein is headed to the White House to either negotiate or to basically say to the president, you're going to have to fire me, sir. I'm not quitting. 
Thank you, New York Times. Hashtag resist. Exactly. They were super psyched to get this story. And there were other people out there who were very quick to sort of say, like, they were FBI, DOJ sources. No, there weren't. There were people who knew FBI or DOJ sources. And then we're relating that information like telephone, like a game of telephone uh, later. So uh, read carefully, folks. And look, there's some people who argue that you don't need to fire Mueller if you're Trump. You can, because of his reporting requirements to the acting AG, the acting AG could very well slow down Mueller's investigation by just larding requirements onto Mueller. I would imagine that Mueller's already contemplated this and that by the time you get, if you do get Democrats coming into the uh, to House, you know, in a couple of months, um, less effective. So they may end up firing Mueller. We just don't know at this point. We just, you know, and I would be surprised if part of this wasn't driven by the fact that they don't want people to pay attention to Kavanaugh. Mitch McConnell, did you play that Mitch McConnell thing on Friday where he said he was going to blow through this? I think it, yeah, we no, should we get that. Yeah, we should play that. We All right. Play. Just trying to figure out where we start with this because it's a, a, there's a lot of information. Here is Mitch McConnell. He said this when, when did he say this? He said this on the 21st. Okay, so Mitch McConnell says this on the 21st. This is on, that, that's Friday, right? Okay. And for at least a couple of weeks, maybe I guess a week, um, Republican, a senior Republican aide learned of the claims made by a uh, woman, Debbie Ramirez. So this was at the least at the beginning of last week as Republicans are desperately trying to speed up the Kavanaugh nomination vote. Mitch McConnell must have known by Friday that this story in the New Yorker was about to break. And here he is at the Christian Healthcare Ministries conference speaking to them uh talking about brett kavanaugh who's been um accused of some fairly non-christian behavior you've watched the fight you've watched the tactics but here's what i want to tell you in the very near future Judge Kavanaugh will be on the United States Supreme Court. So my friends, keep the faith. Don't get rattled by all of this. We're going to plow right through it and do our job. That's right. Nice choice of words there. Yeah, Indeed. Jesus. The str their struggle is going to be for naught. We're just going to do or it. Right. Now remember, ostensibly, the uh, Republicans want to get to the truth of this matter which apparently was preordained um, before Mitch McConnell got up there. Mitch McConnell also knew at that moment that there was a second um, accusation of sexual misconduct that was about to break. Now, there's multiple theories here. Mitch McConnell never liked uh, Brett Kavanaugh as a pick, sort of knew that there was a lot of uh, problems with Brett Kavanaugh. I've said it before, it might have been just a massive coincidence that there was all of these female-oriented commercials saying what a great guy Brett Kavanaugh was and about how they, um, you know, they made him a, a soccer dad or 
coached uh, an all girls basketball team, and he could remember all of their names. He could remember all of them. They were all distinct human individuals to them he's, in a certain sense. He's so obsessed with teenage girls. How could he possibly be a creep? Indeed, and he um, was great in a carpool, which is really helpful. He's actually like doing the traditional mom roles, right? And so maybe it was a huge coincidence. Maybe it was that they wanted to show that he wouldn't repeal Roe v. Wade, which seems a little bit dubious to me. Like, why didn't they roll this stuff out with Gorsuch? Why did, why was there no, surely Neil Gorsuch has one female friend who could get up there and say he's a really good guy. Actually, I think we've just exposed the weakest well, hole in our argument right there. It's possible he has none, but surely they could have found someone who could pretend for that moment. But they were really concerned about this. Mitch McConnell was also concerned about the enormous amount of documents uh, that Kavanaugh was involved with in the uh, Bush administration. So Mitch McConnell, never a fan of Kavanaugh's, knows that there's a whole host of Folks like Brett Kavanaugh, just as um, reactionary, some instances maybe worse, some instances maybe better from the perspective of uh, normal people. But nevertheless, um, maybe maybe Mitch McConnell, who felt that his keeping Merrick Garland off the Supreme Court with an open Supreme Court seat when Donald Trump ran was the reason why Donald Trump won. We don't talk about that much, but there's a lot of data that suggests those same people that Mitch McConnell was talking to, the Christian base, came out because there was an open seat on the Supreme Court. And we read the other day that story about how Republican voters don't see any stakes in this. The Democrats supposedly are afraid that an open seat will generate more interest on the Republican side. Supposedly, the, the Republicans are afraid that it's going to demoralize their base. So if I'm Mitch McConnell and I know we're going to cut Brett Kavanaugh loose, I'm going to get up there and I'm going to make it sound like I am putting 110% on the field. But what can you do? The feminazis won. I don't know. That's just a theory as to what's going on here. I don't, I don't pretend to think that any of these players think that they have control over this process. I think they put stuff out there and they hope um, you know, that things go according to um, a certain trajectory, but you never know. Certainly, nobody knew what Ed Whelan was up to. And we will get to that story in a moment. Well, let's let's go to Ed Whelan. So on that same Thursday afternoon, I think it was, or Friday, it must have been Friday, right? Ed Whelan, who is a, um, a friend of Kavanaugh's. Did you guys talk about this on Friday? I think we touched on it. We touched we? on it. We headlined it at least. Okay. So Ed Whelan is a, a conservative lawyer and commentator. And do we have that first tweet about Charlie Kirk? Oh, yeah. Let's start with this. This is all interrelated, folks. No, not from Charlie Kirk, but about him. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, this tweet, this right, right, that one right there. Okay, so this comes up. This guy, um, Jack Goldsmith, who is a, um, I think he's a, uh, you know, one of the guys who who, who, who may have been f formerly in the DOJ. And uh, he's a legal commentator and a professor, I believe. The conservative legal movement, he writes, led by the Federal Society, has had extraordinary successes producing A-plus judicial candidates and fostering conservative legal ideas. Its seriousness and achievements contrast sharply with the rest of what passes for conservatism in the U.S. Now, I think that's a dubious claim 
frankly, but certainly in terms of their efficacy, all we've done is talk about Federalist Society people in the DOJ um, and uh, everybody who's ever going to get nominated for the Supreme Court on the right is from the Federalist Society. And some other guy uh, responds, I don't know who he is. One reason for this is that the law, and particularly appellate constitutional law, does not allow space for frauds. The judicial conservative movement isn't open to penetration by grifters and idiot populists because the barriers to entry are too high. No Charlie Kirks here. And there's two ways that it's pro a problem. One, here's Charlie Kirk weighing in on the Kavanaugh defense a day later that breaking Kavanaugh says he has calendars from 1982 that exonerate him and show his accuser's story doesn't match up at all. Now, the Kavanaugh people have since admitted, well, just because I didn't put going to uh, try and rape a woman tonight at a party. Underage drinking party. Yeah, underage drinking party where uh, hopefully I will be able to cover a woman's mouth while she tries to scream. A girl's uh, mouth while she tries to scream. No, stop. Um, they said that doesn't prove anything, but it's just he does put stuff in his calendar uh, that his accuser's story doesn't match up at all. I am so impressed that he has 35-year-old high school calendars. This is definitely the type of guy we need on the Supreme Court. <laughs> he knew he was going to need an alibi 35 years later. I mean, very possibly. I, I don't think it's improbable that uh, a kid like that would do that. Um and, and keep the calendars. I mean, if I had a calendar that I was not, if I, that I kept, I, I may have one from college. Um, it's not inconceivable. I've got a box full of like my colorings from second grade in my closet at home. Boom. There you go. So that's evidence. Of and, <laughs> and does any of them, an alibi. does any of them depict you trying to sexually assault any type of woman? Uh, no comment. Well, <laughs> because if they didn't, then you'd be in the clear. So getting back to the idea of the conservative legal movement not promoting grifters or liars or frauds, here is a tweet by Ed Whalen. He, like I say, conservative lawyer and commentator, president of an ethics and public policy Washington think tank the Ethics and Public Policy Center. And this guy, Ed Whelan, went on and he was teasing it for days. He was tweezing it, tweeting it for days. But before he did, this guy, Matt Whitlock, who is the communications director for Senator Orrin Hatch, deputy chief of staff for Orrin Hatch, had this to say about Ed Whelan. Ed Whelan had tweeted, I think it was on Thursday or Wednesday, a horrific incident similar to the one the accuser alleges may well have occurred. But if so, she's got the wrong guy. Kavanaugh wasn't present. As this and much more will confirm. And Matt Whitlock, the guy who works for Grassley, I mean, Orrin Hatch on the... On the um, Senate uh, Judiciary Committee says, keep an eye on Ed's tweets the next few days. Now, why would you say that unless you thought Ed was going to present something blockbuster the next few days? And he did. Meanwhile, understand, too, that there was a story, uh, the Washington Post, Kavanaugh and his allies have been privately discussing a defense that would not question whether the incident happened to Ford, but instead would raise doubts that the attacker was Kavanaugh. This is according to a person familiar with the discussions. Kathleen Parker comes out with an uh, uh, op-ed piece earlier in the week. Maybe there was someone who looked like Kavanaugh, and she doesn't know who it is. I mean, we started to see this everywhere. Nobody took it seriously. 
But why would they, all of these people have this same idea? That maybe this 15-year-old didn't know. Now, they supposedly don't have any facts about it, right? So Ed Whelan comes out with a huge tweet thread that lays out the look of of the house that lays out the look of the house in Maryland that shows pictures of a guy who lived in a house who had a party who was in that circle of friends and those pictures they looked almost eerily similar to people who didn't know either one of these guys <laughs> they both look like white waspy guys exactly and if you look at their pictures today like they look somewhat similar but and he was so sure of this i mean he goes on and on he said early on by one week today i expect judge kavanaugh will have been clearly vindicated on this matter Compelling evidence will show his categorical, uh, categorical denial to be true. Senator Feinstein will be apologizing to Judge Kavanaugh. And do you have the tweet thread? I'm looking, he deleted it, so I'm looking So he puts out this tweet thread, which, of course, has now been since de deleted. And not only floats the idea that there is a doppelganger out there, but names him. I'm not going to say the guy's name, but names him. Coincidentally, this is one of the guys who signed a character witness for Brett Kavanaugh. But this guy is now like a middle school teacher somewhere who's just been named as the attempted rapist of Dr. Blasey Ford back when she was a 15-year-old. And, and people are stunned because this guy's a lawyer and the president of the Ethics and Public Policy Center, one would think that he would know better than to name a private citizen as an attempted rapist. Well, These people are idiots. And then the world. within moments, we had... Dr. Ford, uh, Dr. Blasey Ford um, put out a statement. I knew both of these people pretty well. Uh, and I could definitely tell the, them apart. I know exactly who it was. It was Brett Kavanaugh. And um, this other person I'm, I was friends with. <laughs> I've this got other one person between who you've ran. Right, here's, yeah, here's one of them. National Kavanaugh's my, uh, home was 3.6 miles away. Smith's 4.3. Judges 10 miles, and the female classmate seven miles. Like I mean, this is, this is Deep like the legal sign. Thinking. Yes, I mean it's just bizarre. And then everyone around Whelan pretends they had no idea what he was up to. They all say, "Oh, he kept us all in the dark," which means. Uh, one of two things. A, they're lying, which I think is arguable. We should probably have an investigation into that because if Judge Kavanaugh had any part in trying to accuse a second person, that would show a little bit less than what we want out of a judicial temperament. Don't you see Chuck Grass? Like, is there some other guy that looked like you or something? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, most of them, right? Can we just, uh, there must have been some other guy, you're not that distinctive looking, can't we just get it out that way? I thought Cory Booker was my magical Negro friend. It's also funny the degree to which these people cannot get their defenses straight, right? Because you've seen defenders tweeting that uh, Christine Ford is a lying bitch, you've seen them tweet Oh, they're that throwing everything if it did it. happen, it would be okay. And you've seen people tweet that it was some doppelganger. So I don't know, guys. And here uh, it's on the IM. Uh, play this at Fox and Friends. Um, Fox and Friends 
of course, got right on the ball with this one. Here it is. Uh, here's Fox and Friends. And they may have broken the case. It's early in the morning, so we got to get this out there. Here it is. This is Fox and Friends. This must have been on Friday morning. There was one other factor, and Ed, I'm sure uh, being down in Washington yesterday, you saw the fact that uh, a fellow by the name of Ed Whelan, who had been yeah. one of the clerks for Antonin Scalia and a supporter of Judge Kavanaugh, he looked at what uh, Christine Ford told the Washington Post and figured out, okay, these now, people... Now, pause it for one second. There were actually, apparently, Whelan was out asking friends of Blasey Ford before the Washington po before she came out and outed herself. So somehow he had some foreknowledge of what was going on, of who she was. But continue. Ed Whelan, who had been yeah. one of the clerks for Antonin Scalia and a supporter of Judge Kavanaugh, he looked at what uh, Christine Ford told the Washington Post and figured out, okay, these people were named, these four people, where did they live? And looked at what she had said and figured out what house it may have ha happened at because it was the house closest to the golf course. Yeah. And then realized whose house it was and looked at a picture of the young man who lived there at the time, who was a classmate of Mr. Kavanaugh's, put up side-by-side -side images, they look a lot alike. So really? Is it a case of mistaken identity? Exactly. Now, Dr. Ford put out a statement last night insisting she knows the difference between Judge Kavanaugh Zero and this other person, and there's no chance, so we'll see. Right, so we'll see. So we'll see. A lot of identities. They still, even then, they were still trying to float it, right? Even after it had been completely shot down and everybody had basically run away from Ed Whelan faster than I've seen anybody run away from anybody ever. And so uh, Ed Whelan has now taken a leave of absence from his ethics group after uh, offering to resign. And they basically said, well, we'll take a month and then we'll revisit because in a month, Nobody's going to care that Ed Whelan is back there in the non-grifter world. Let's just bring that last tweet. Oh, you just got rid of, rid of it. In the non-grifter world of conservative legal thought. Right? Here it is. Let me just read that again. One key reason for this is the law, particularly appellate constitutional law, does not allow for space for frauds. The judicial conservative movement, this is a former uh, Scalia, right, uh, clerk, isn't open to penetration by grifters and idiot populace because of the barriers to entry are too high. Idiot. No Charlie Kirks here, right. That barrier to entry seems to have maybe dropped a little bit more than this guy was aware of. Thinking Ed Whelan, serious and questions, like etch-a-sketch an analyst. Meanwhile, we should also just add... I don't even know if I have this story, but I um, there was a uh, a guy hired to round out the communications team for Chuck Grassley on the Senate Judiciary Committee, and um, <laughs> turns out that he was uh, he was available to them because at his last job. He was accused of sexual harassment, and uh, <laughs> they hired him specifically to marshal the Kavanaugh nomination through the Senate Judiciary Committee. Well, he's got experience in such things. I mean, exactly. that actually, like, oh, no, I'm super good at dealing with sexual <laughs> harassment charges. Okay, fair enough. We're on the same page. Um. Uh, Cory Booker is my friend. <laughs> Unbelievable. All right. So, but let's look at some of the uh, attempts by the right to defend uh, Brett Kavanaugh. Wait, before we get to this video, let's just look at the bus tour that's been going around. As you know, there was no reason for the Republicans to in any way think that Brett Kavanaugh would have any type of trouble with women. They just coincidentally had a crew 
of people who signed up for the Women for Kavanaugh tour. And if you look closely, almost half of them are actually women. The More other half... More bending scene than you'd expect. Right. The, <laughs> the majority of the... There are six women and seven and men. Hi, my name's Dale. I identify as a female Christian who does not believe in rape or abortion. There you go. <laughs> that looks like a fun bus. Man. I mean, first of all, I would imagine that bus could hold about four times the amount of people. Hi, my name's Brad. I identify but, as a female tell me conservative. This. Tell me this, okay? Here's the thing. Here's the, the alternate theory about when I suggested to Hayes that they knew this was coming about Kavanaugh, that he had some problem with women. He said, well, that could be because there's concern that he may be overturning Roe v. Wade. But zoom back in on that poster that that woman on the Woman for Kavanaugh tour is carrying. It is a Justice for Life confirmed Kavanaugh. And all of them wearing shirts that say, I am the pro-life generation. I mean... If this was about trying to smooth over the issue of Roe v. Wade, that would be a very bad way of doing it. Counterproductive. Slightly counterproductive. So I'm not convinced that's what was going on here. All right, let's look at some of the entries uh, that uh, take place in trying to defend Judge Kavanaugh. This, of course, was from last week, right? Uh, just at the end of the week. This guy, um, yeah. this attorney, this is before the second accuser came forward. Here is on, I guess, Fox and Friends Weekend Edition, a, uh, an, a right-wing attorney trying to um, debate the Kavanaugh accusation. We only have a minute, and I want to be fair to all three of you. Uh, quickly, each of you, how does this play out over the next week? Does Brett Kavanaugh get confirmed? We'll start with you, uh, Brad. I believe the judge will be confirmed. This is an act that alleged to have occurred when he was a juvenile, and fundamental to our system of juvenile justice is rehabilitation. And for him to have rose to this level to be nominated to the Supreme Court suggests that he's been rehabilitated, if in fact it is true. First off, this is... We'll get to the circular uh, reasoning in a moment. Let's just take the low-hanging fruit. Judge Kavanaugh is not being tried for this. Now, maybe there's an opportunity to try him for it, uh, but he's not being tried for this. He's not being uh, con uh, adjudicated on the, uh, or cannot be convicted of a crime during this process. The question is, is it possible that he had enough proximity to what went on that makes him unsuitable to be a judge? on the Supreme Court, period, end of story. But the idea that there was no accountability for him as he moved through this process, remember, after clerking and his mentor has had to leave the judiciary over sexual harassment claims, the idea that he could get through there becomes evidence in and of itself that he's righteous. Right. I mean, this is the way it works in the conservative mind. If you're rich, it's because God deemed it that way. And God would never deem a immoral man rich. So you must be moral as well. It's the same calculation. If you've gotten to the if you've achieved this amount of success, like, I mean, could you become a Supreme Court justice if you had done something like this? Like, could you become president if you had done something like this? Good point. Obviously not. It's like the secret. Like, it's such a bullshit interpretation of Christianity. Totally. Totally. And it's all about redemption. And it's all about this Christian worldview that, like, the children are innocent. So innocent that nothing they do can be held against them. Unless they're black. Yeah, I was Unless say, they're black. I mean, Unless, I mean if, I, if you want to this there. and have like a restorative view of justice, sounds good to me. <laughs> I don't hear that coming from any of these people in any type of structural sense. And, and the question's not even whether or not like he's been rehabilitated. And I think like somebody's actually going around saying like, if you, even if you did this, the fact that there's no accusations as an adult shows that he has really turned around. But if what that guy says is true, that this happened when he was younger 
and he must be rehabilitated. Why doesn't Brett Kavanaugh come out and say, I did it, I'm sorry? Like, I mean, at the beginning of this process, I said that if he'd said that, I, I would see him getting confirmed. And there being an argument to confirm him, at least in terms of that. I think there was a lot of other problems with Brett Kavanaugh that we don't talk about anymore. Never mind the fact that, like, all his huge personal debt seemed to go away in the Baseball six months tickets. before. Yeah. But, I mean, putting that aside, how can you say that it's irrelevant because it happened when he was a kid when he's saying it never happened? They still don't have their strategy straight. They don't. They do not. Or they just don't care because they think they have the power to push this through. The, I think they just don't care. Uh, they assume they have the power. They just don't care. They just don't care. And I bring you a supposed CNN focus group of women, five women brought together to talk about Kavanaugh. Now, I want you to hear this. And I want you to know that CNN said this was a focus group. What's the point of a focus group? To get the sense of how Republican women at large in general are perceiving this. We're going to take a, a sample, sort of a random sample of Republican women to get a real sense of what's going on in the Republican. That's the way they branded this segment. That's the way they led into this segment. Let's hear from these women and and... And two or three, I think, are, are women of color. Let's, let's listen to this uh, segment. A show of hands. How many of you believe Judge Kavanaugh when he says this didn't happen? I believe him. Believe him I, do. I, I, believe, I do believe him. I, I, I believe, believe him. him. How can right. we believe the word of a woman or something that happened 36 years ago when this guy has an impeccable reputation? Pause it, pause it. That is Lourdes Castillo de la Peña. She is a Republican voter. How can we believe the word of this guy? There was nobody, nobody that has spoken ill will about him. Everyone that speaks about him, this guy's an altar boy, you know, a scout. He's, you know, because one woman made an allegation. Sorry, I don't buy it. But in the grand scheme of things, my goodness, you, there was no intercourse. There was maybe a touch. Pause it. Can this is Irina Villarino. She is a Republican voter. That's the way she's ID'd. He, really? 36 <laughs> years later? She's no, still stuck on that? Off. Had it happened? I mean, we're talking about a 15-year-old girl, which I respect. You know, I'm a woman. I respect. And we're talking about a 17-year-old boy in high school with testosterone running high. Tell me what boy hasn't done this in high school. Pause it. Just go back a little bit. This is uh, Gina, Gina Sosa, just a Republican voter. Go ahead. Tell me what boy hasn't done this in high school. Please, I would like to know. Why would she come forward if this wasn't true? Because it has basically destroyed her family. She's had to move. She's gone undercover. She's gotten death threats. Um, so if she's lying, why come forward? She's also destroying yeah. his life, his mm -hmm. wife's mm -hmm. lives, his children's yeah. lives, mm -hmm. his Daughters. career. Mm -hmm. I mean, why didn't she come out sooner if she's telling the truth? Why didn't she come out when he was going into the Bush White House? Why didn't she come out when he's been a federal judge exactly. for over a decade why not have a thorough investigation why instead not? of just the two of them he said she said because it doesn't happen? matter it does not matter what everyone else has to say this is what happened though with clarence thomas and anita hill the fbi investigated it took three days done why not now well this is not the same this is a high school kid i mean it's not yeah. anita hill story does something that allegedly happened some 30 plus years ago matter today you can't judge the character of a man based on what he did at 17. And I would hate to think that 30, 40 years later, somebody's going to destroy your life because somewhere exactly. at some party, you, it's not right, but maybe you touch somebody the way you were not supposed to. And who brought the to. alcohol for these and kids? As women, though, do you have <laughs> some sympathy for her, for what she's going through? No, I have no sympathy. And perhaps maybe at that moment she liked him, and maybe he didn't pay attention to her afterwards, and he went out she's with another girl, and she got bitter, or whatever Sorry. the situation is. They're kids. Yeah. Everything. Okay, well, uh, that last woman who just spoke, Lourdes Castillo de la Peña, has served on the National Senatorial Committee and hosted a 1,000-plate fundraiser for Ted Cruz's uh, campaign at her home. Gina Sosa, 
who said all 17-year-old boys have done something like this, was a congressional candidate in the Republican primary this year. This year! Angela Vasquez is a community council member in Kendall and Dade County. These were not GOP voters. They were literally GOP operatives. It's all coming from uh, James Sarecki. Um, he also goes on to say, it's odd to assemble a panel of largely Latina women in which most, if not all, the women are Cuban-Americans who is are far it? more conservative and supportive of Trump. Casanos. Um, so, first off, it's fine to say, here's a focus group of female Republican operatives. Here's a focus group of professional sense, Cuban political operatives who are female and Republican. Let's get a sense of what the Republican establishment, the female re Republican establishment thinks about this. But it's, to pretend and brand it as a focus group of just Republican voters is simply a lie. Did it, CNN get punked here? Like, what's no going on? It's weird. It's like, it's like CNN's laziness and wanting to act like, yes, we're getting it out in the community to hear what the community no. thinks. But they have these people in their Rolodex, right? That's where the laziness right. comes in. And, but, and these people, yeah, they, they want to be, I guess, I don't know. Do they want to be identified as Republican operatives? I mean. No, they want it to make it. They, they want to right. look like we're just average. We're just average women. We don't have a we don't I mean, we don't have a huge agenda here. We're just average women. We just go by what we see. We're not professionally invested in what we're talking about. Right. It's not like we're professionals. Unbelievable. All right, we got more on this. Um, a lot more to talk about. We're going to take a break and head into the uh, fun half. Um, we have we will have hopefully an update on what's going on with Rosenstein. Uh, we will talk about the. Um, this assault on uh, so-called legal immigration, right? Um, uh, I'm just looking at this list of stories. It's just insane. It's been uh, a crazy day. Um, but we will have more in just a moment. We're going to take a quick break, head into the fun half. The number is 646-257-3920. If you... Um, if you enjoy this show and uh, would like to support uh, even the free version, become a member today by going to jointhemajorityreport.com. When you uh, join the majority report at jointhemajorityreport.com, uh, a couple of bucks a week gets you five shows a week. And uh, as a way of saying thank you, we give you extra content every day. Join the majority report.com. Uh, check it out. Also, just coffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code uh, majority, get 10% off of your just coffee. Uh, Michael, tomorrow is Tuesday. What will happen Tuesday night? What will happen Tuesday night will be the Michael Brooks show, Alberto Almina, who is a Brazilian political historian and pollster, is going to join us to review the last week of the campaign there going into the first round of that election on October 7th. And then Matt Taibbi returns in studio, and we will make fun of Thomas Friedman. Is Thomas Friedman still alive? I had no uh, idea. He's still worth making fun of, if anything, just for wish fulfillment. Even if he is dead. Yeah, even if he and was dead, we would be right, joking then about his death cancel. columns. Uh, Patreon.com slash TMBS. Jamie? Yeah, so this weekend on the Antifada, we just recorded an episode with our friend Tanzim uh, about a really cool pamphlet that she co-authored called uh, Overthrowing the Illuminati. Or, um, the, well, the website is Overthrowing the Illuminati. I'm sorry. The pamphlet is How to Overthrow the Illuminati, and it's geared towards black and brown teens uh, who believe in Illuminati conspiracy theories, and it takes, it takes this belief seriously, right? It's a sincere attempt to reckon with how fucked up the world is but um it basically leads them to the conclusion that the problem is not the illuminati the problem is capitalism and i think it's a really really good work of writing it explains some really complicated marxist concepts in a really clear jargon-free way so we had a really good conversation with her about it and that is uh patreon.com slash the antifada matt 
I am an audiobook narrator now. I did the first installment of Hope Leslie, uh, a book from 1827 about uh, so a lot of different themes. There's Pe- there's a slave from a Pequod chieftain, and so there's a lot of good historical elements of this book. It's really forgotten. Anyway, you have to be a member to hear me uh, narrate that. So patreon.com slash literary hangover if you want a f- that audiobook. Wait, aren't you going to put that into the public uh, domain? I am, but after I'm finished. So, ah, so well, you can it's see in process. Real, oh yeah, yep. interesting. You get a better, like an insider view as to what uh, how how these things are made. It's like installments. All right, folks. Six four six two five seven thirty nine twenty is the number. We will go to the fun half. You can IM us through the app at majorityapp.com. Jamie and I may have a disagreement. Yeah, you can't just say whatever you want about people just because you're rich. I have an absolute right to mock them on YouTube. He's up there buggy whipping like he's the boss. I am not your employer. You know, I'm tired of the negativity. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. You're nervous, you're a little bit uh, upset, you're riled up. Yeah, maybe you should rethink your defense of that, you fucking idiots. We're just going to get rid of you. All right. But dude. 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 Uh, you want to smoke this joint? Yes. Do you feel like you are a dinosaur? <laughs> Some good shit. Exactly. I'm happy now. It's a win-win. It's a win-win-win. Oh, uh, hell yeah. Now listen to me. Two, three, four, five times. Eight, four, seven, nine, oh, six, five, oh, one, four, five, seven, two, thirty-eight. 56, 27, one half, five eighths, 3.9 billion. Wow. He's the ultimate math nerd. Don't you see? Why don't you get a real job instead of spewing vitriol and hatred, you left wing limbaugh? Everybody's taking their dumb juice today. Come on, Sammy. Dance, dance, dance. My first post-coital scene with uh, a woman. I'm hoping to add more moves to my repertoire. All I have is the dip and the swirl. Fine, we can double dip. Yes, this is a perfect moment. No. Wait, what? You make under a million dollars a year. You're scum. You're nothing. Excuse me? Fuck you, you fucking liberal elite. I think you belong in jail. Thank you for saying that, Sam. You're a horrible, despicable person. All right, going to take a quick break. I want to take a moment to talk to some of the libertarians out there. Take whatever vehicle you want to drive to the library. What you're talking about is jibber jab. Classic. I'm feeling more chill already. Donald Trump can kiss all of our asses. Hey, Sam. Hey, Andy. You guys ready to uh, do some evil? Hitler was such an idiot. You think I might be a Nazi? Agreed. No. Death to America. You. Yes. Wow. Wow, that's weird. No way! Unbelievable. This guy's got a really good hook. Throw our hands up. <laughs> Ooh. Wow. Um, but Sam, I gotta get off. No worries. Ooh. Let's let's. I want to just flesh this out a little bit. I mean, look, it's a free speech issue. If you don't like me, hey, 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 shut up. Thank you for calling into the Majority Report. Sam will be with you shortly. Okay. We are back, Sam Cedar, on the Majority Report, ladies and gentlemen. We are continuing with this um, really nutso week. And it's Monday. So just to go over it again, Trump's at the U.N., right? We could do like a whole week of like just Trump at the U.N., like how destructive that's going to be. I wanted to Uh talk about what's going on in Yemen. Originally, uh, a week or so ago, I uh, interviewed uh, Professor Juan Cole about uh, what's happening in Yemen uh, for Ring of Fire. We're going to play that uh, at one point. Um. We have Thursday's hearings. Apparently, Trump is not addressing the Rod Rosenstein thing until Thursday. Is that the update now? What would you do? Send in the IM? Yeah. Okay, so uh, the press secretary 
the White House press secretary? It's not coming up for me. Oh, here it is. Statement on, uh, this is from Sarah Sanders, the statement on Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein. At the request of the Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein, he and President Trump had an extended conversation to discuss the recent news stories. Because the President is at the United Nations General Assembly and has a full schedule of leaders from around the world, they'll meet on Thursday when the President returns to Washington, D.C. Now, uh, I wonder why they want to do it on Thursday. Well, they obviously want to try and divert as much attention possible from Kavanaugh. Do it on a Thursday. Um, I'm thinking uh, Thursday. <laughs> Th- nothing going on Thursday. How about Thursday, guys? Unbelievable. <laughs> this is just... It's I'm just, just spitballing, but what about the Jew gets clipped on Thursday? Put What's it on one of Kavanaugh's calendars. <laughs> it was on a calendar we made in 1990. Oh, is that the Arizona representative yeah. ad? Okay, yeah, let's talk about this. This is pretty funny. This is just like, it would take a little palate cleanser. Um, so as you know, there are, uh, there are people running for Congress all around the country. And uh, one of those people... Democratic House candidate David Brill is running against Representative Paul Gozar. Paul Gozar has um, nine siblings. And uh, apparently six of them, if they were in Gozar's district, would not vote for him. Paul Gozar is one of Trump's most ardent supporters. He's advocated against the Dreamers. He's voiced support for the southern border wall. He joined a Belgian politician known for his anti-Muslim views for a lengthy dinner in July. Geert Wilders. Geert Wilders, he really? God. (laughs) Of course. Sure. That's that's an objective fascist there that Um, guy i saw that guy speak at the milo party at the rnc and it was some of the most vile disgusting racist stuff i've ever heard anybody say in any forum and i think that but he's he's charming at dinner and that dutch fascist stuff is some of the forerunners of the no i'm a classical liberal branding they're big on that um and so uh the brill campaign became aware that Paul Gozar's um, brothers and sisters don't like him and are disgusted by his uh, behavior. And so they sh- he shot an ad with them. And here is that ad now. None of this is pleasant for any of us. It's horrible to have to do this. To speak up against my brother, it brings sadness to me. This isn't just about Paul. This is about their family. I think my brother has traded a lot of the values we had at at our kitchen table. I couldn't be quiet any longer, nor should any of us be. We got to stand up for our good name. This is not who we are. It's intervention time. And intervention time means that you go to vote and you go to vote Paul out. My name is Tim Gosar. My name is Jennifer Gosar. Gaston Gosar. Joan Gosar. Grace Gosar. David Gosar. Paul Gosar is my brother. My brother. My brother. And I endorse Dr. Brill. Dr. Brill. Dr. Brill. And I wholeheartedly endorse Dr. David Brill for Congress. I'm Dr. David Brill, and I approve this message. (laughs) (laughs) I'm Dr. David Brill, and happy Thanksgiving. (laughs) And I just stuck the scalpel in. Wow. Like, you know, and, and Brill, when you cut back to him, he's like, it's like the whole, like the whole thing is taking his breath away. Like, oh, geez, I just watched six uh, brothers and sisters basically say, vote uh, for my brother's opponent. I want to see his the Gosar's ad with the two siblings that are in his corner. That'd be hilarious. Is there a comeback no, ad? No, I hope so. He did respond, though. Did you guys see this? Yeah, what he did he say? Those of my siblings who chose to film ads against me are all liberal Democrats who hate President Trump. 
These disgruntled Hillary supporters, sick, <laughs> there's a few misspellings in here, are related by blood to me, but like leftists everywhere, they put political ideology before family. Lenin, Mao, and Kim Jong, Kim Jong Un, sick, would be proud. There you go. You're a bunch of disingenuous bastards. <laughs> and those guys are proud. That would be cool if Kim Jong remember like Kim Jong un just did a little North Korean press release, like also shouts to the siblings who threw their brother under the bus in the in a service of political ideology. That's the type of thing we approve of here. Also we're gonna be resuming right. testing. <laughs> just FYI. Since we're since yeah. we're um uh we're in this mode of, of siblings um turning around and calling out other siblings. Um Multiple people have sent me this video, and uh, I know it bums people out, but I, I have a retort to, to the point that's being made here. So I'm going to try and not make this about Jimmy Dore and his problems, but I'm going to make it against the argument. Why would I not push back against this? One of the most exciting, electric, um, competent politicians that we have on the left, who more importantly has been uh, organizing, has been creating caucuses before she's even elected, right? Going around and creating solidarity amongst um, those people in the Democratic Party who are to the left of where the, the mainstream of the Democratic Party is. And building uh, solidarity, helping people getting elected, promoting, raising f uh, money, promoting ideas. Corporate. Now, I'm not saying that these people are, uh, that, that, that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is above uh, criticism. No. We should always critique our politicians but we should do so uh, based upon the their the votes and the issues that they promote and give them space to create power for themselves and look if if AOC came out and said um say in the context of uh, Palestinian rights, like I don't believe that Palestinians deserve any rights. I would have a problem with that. And I would say that. And we have been holding her, trying to hold her accountable on some of these issues. Of course. But like course. in a nice way. Well, it's not just in a nice way. It's in a way that is productive, right? Because the whole point is not so that uh, we like her. The whole point is so that we get a government that functions in a way that we want she has that's, the power and the base to do what she set out to do that's and the point of politics the point of politics is not for all of us to sit here and feel good about who we support or what it's nice when that happens but that's not the point of this that's the point of junior high school to be to like have your click be your click so That's with that in mind, subtitle of our show, yeah, have your click, be your click. Exactly. The majority report. Here is Jimmy Dore bringing up what, what is one of the most ridiculous, ill-informed. Play the play the video. And I said, Cynthia Nixon, who called him a liar on the debate, quit lying. She told him. And uh, now I wonder if she's going to, oh, she, is she going to tell all the progressives to vote for the Democrats' version of Trump, which is Andrew Cuomo? Pause it. And so yeah, the, the question is, is Cynthia Nixon going to tell Democrats for, to vote for Andrew Cuomo? I don't know if she is. I think she's going to stay on the WFP, li uh, the Working Families Party line, because uh, they need 50,000 votes to make sure that they maintain their line position. But nevertheless, continue. And uh, like nobody can expect her to do that. But well, watch this. You think it's 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 wor it's even worse than that. You guys ready for this? Watch this. What I also look forward to moving forward is us rallying behind all Democratic nominees, including the governor, to make sure that he wins in November. 
I, she's a Democrat, so she has to tell everybody that the, Andrew Cuomo is the answer. Pause it. <laughs> In addition to her not telling everybody that Andrew Cuomo is the answer, what she's telling people is that Andrew Cuomo will be better than the Republican. She endorsed Cynthia Nixon. Of course. But there's only two choices on the ballot, folks, of anybody who's going to win. It's either the Republican or the Democrat. Uh, in this governor's race. I don't know if there's a third or fourth party uh, people, but I got news for you. They're not going to win. One million Democrats out of the 1.5 that cast votes for governor voted for Andrew Cuomo. She doesn't have to do anything. She will not lose her position. She will not lose her candidacy if she says, and people should not vote for Cuomo, they should vote for the Republican, or they should vote for someone else and split the votes. You know what would happen if she does that? She can do it, but it would cut into her ability to actually do real things for real people. Not people who want to sit around and feel good about themselves, and that's the agenda. Her agenda is not to make people feel good about themselves. Her agenda is to get specific issues passed through Congress so that they are executed and the American people enjoys them. And there is no theory whatsoever, certainly doesn't come from this video, but I challenge anybody to give me a theory that shows how AOC can achieve more progressive change by coming out and saying at this point, in the lead up to the general election, don't vote for the Democrat at the top of the ticket. Also, she said this in response to a question about it. Like she's not out there campaigning with him at every she, step. I think it's not. really important to remember that Andrew Cuomo is our savior. He's the greatest politician, arguably, of the 21st century. She said century. even Cuomo, right? right. Yeah, even Cuomo is amazing. Exactly. Because I'm a Democrat now. And All right, just play it back and then chill. let listen to more. Nominees, including the governor, to make sure that he wins in November. Yes, including I, the governor. She's a Democrat, so she has to tell everybody that the, Andrew Cuomo is the answer. Do you see what the problem is with progressives trying to take over the Democratic Party? Do you see the problem? Yes, I see one of the problems that they are given no room to do even platitudes, to do even the most basic hitting and bunting in terms of building their own political base. Like making an enemy, a public enemy of Andrew Cuomo helps progressives get Medicare for all. How? Making an enemy of Andrew Cuomo, this is after she already endorsed Cynthia Nixon in the primary. But going out and saying you prefer a Republican to win than a, a Democrat. Now, there's two, there's two options. One, she has no ability to make that happen. Or two, she does have an ability to make that happen by coming out, right? If she makes that happen and there is a Republican in the governorship of New York State. How is that helpful to getting any, any of the proposals that we are hoping for come to fruition? New any Yorkers of them, that don't have health care will wake up. Any of them. They'll wake up, Sam. They'll We're looking up. at New York now with an opportunity, largely in part because of her, to actually have a democratic state senate and a democratic state assembly and they need a governor who will sign these things andrew cuomo will not sign them in the way that cynthia nixon would have but he's going to sign them a lot better than a republican would you know what else also really is stands out to me about this is let's even indulge in a fantasy scenario that somehow All right, well let me finish my oh, point sorry, go ahead. so the other uh, uh, thing is that um, AOC cannot influence the outcome of the election. That she just says, don't vote for Andrew Cuomo and alienates the one million people who voted for Andrew Cuomo in the primary, never mind the other millions. Now, m no one has talked about what a bigger crap stain Andrew Cuomo is in New York State over the past seven years than I have. I, I challenge anybody who is not active in, in, in New York politics, who doesn't do that.
like on any medium who has maligned Andrew Cuomo with very good reason more than I. But the fact of the matter is he's better than a Republican. Even the Republicans understand this dynamic. We just need someone to sign it, to sign the legislation, particularly now, particularly now. And the idea that she has no ability to influence the outcome, it's all signaling. That's what is wanted here. Billy said that Jenny's one of the cool kids, and she's not. And so now I don't like Billy. Exactly. Well, I'm looking at the Nixon uh, Cuomo results, and Brooklyn went for Cuomo. So, uh, like, her constituents, a lot of them voted for Cuomo. So if she starts going on just bomb throwing, like, but Jimmy what's Joe the value of it? Like, well, that's exactly. actually like, that's what? another thing that always like, like, misses in this analysis is actually that. And, and sometimes you see it with some people who follow characters like this on social media. They do start to attack, essentially, the Democratic base. Because the thing that is un- inconvenient for this analysis is a lot of normal, regular, everyday Democratic voters who are going to need to be your allies, even in your greatest fantasy scenario of a third party, vote for people like Andrew Cuomo. And to basically just say that they... That's they're all just sheep or morons or their perspective should be dismissed is actually and the much more toxic subtext because even on sake on the low level, like whatever, take your whack at AOC. Sure, maybe you're upset at her for whatever. But the larger message of, well, it's obviously all these mouth breathing idiots that voted for Cuomo or are excited about Andrew Gillum. What are you saying? about whole swaths of people you need to engage it's, with it, and it, respect. It's pretty disgusting. It's vote shaming from another angle. Well, it, it's who is, I mean, I mean, well, look, I don't think there's anything wrong, wrong with vote shaming. The issue is, the, the issue is, the issue is, um, what is going to empower this politician who has an agenda that you uh, subscribe to? What is going to empower her? If Andrew Cuomo runs for president, is it going to be more powerful that she said, I voted for him as governor over a Republican, but he should not be our nominee than vice versa. I mean, these are all basic. These are just like basic rudimentary. This is all about this is about power. This is about how you get uh, what you know, you fulfill agendas, not about. I don't like you because you said a nice thing about something. And it's not even saying a nice thing about it. It's saying, I think a Democrat is better than a Republican. And if someone wants to debate that, I'll have a debate with anybody on the left about that. And I will debate anybody who articulates a perspective that's different from that. But continue, continue with this. Oh, there's more? Oh, yeah. A, it's never going to happen, and B, they get co-opted. She's co-opted. What do you? you, you, Let me. I don't know. Am I making too much out of this stuff? Yes. Uh, He's already. That was hard to listen to. I mean, that that was that ten seconds was hard to hear. It really was. Really, you couldn't just wait a month. You couldn't. You couldn't wait until maybe November first to. All right, pause it now. Let me explain why you wouldn't wait till November tenth to do this. Because if you're going to do it, you do it at a time. Well, first of all, she was probably asked the question, but you're going to do it at a time where it doesn't make you look like you're a Johnny come lately. You just do it because that's where one of the sources of your power comes from, the Democratic Party. And she's trying to leverage that power to do good things. So if you're going to do it, you do it early. Because if you're going to do it, and you know you're going to do it, you do it early. And the idea that AOC can leverage anything from Andrew Cuomo at this point is moronic. Continue. Support behind this guy. Why? Who what, has what's the difference? What is? What's the difference? What's the difference? What? No, no. I'm asking you. Well, what for would, me, it's like why? You know, we were. Why do people have to keep endorsing these Democrats that are corporate tools? Why does she have to hurry up? I'm, no, I'm asking. What, what's the difference between now and November 1st? Well, I was hoping that he, she would push him without giving yeah. support. So this is exactly right, Steph. She got nothing for this. 
like Cynthia Nixon, like some people were saying, well, maybe Cynthia Nixon will get Andrew Cuomo to admit or to agree to sign on a single payer if it gets passed and then she'll endorse him. Or maybe she'll get something and then she'll nothing. They got nothing from Andrew Cuomo. Nothing. Okay. Trying to get in the general election for AOC, trying to get something from uh, Andrew Cuomo at this point would be like pushing a rope. All the leverage happens in the primary. Cynthia Nixon got Andrew Cuomo to change his perspective on the IDC, to come out for a marijuana legalization, uh, and a host of other smaller little moves that he made that were a function of the pressure that she was putting on. But Andrew Cuomo knows that AOC, who won her primary with 25,000 votes, let's keep in mind, does not have the ability to sink him who got a million votes in the primary. No, it would be basically just hurting herself. Well, but also, exactly. She doesn't have the power to hurt him. She doesn't really have the power to help him, I don't think. She has the power to help herself a little bit, though. Exactly. No, help Hence, anybody. all the constituents who voted for her. Exactly. Exactly. And in addition to that, say you even had this third party scenario somehow came true. Third parties always govern in coalition. So even this dynamic of moral purity that you somehow think will magically be bestowed upon you if you didn't deal with the Democratic Party as like some type of metaphysical entity will always happen because then you're in a European scenario and you're the left party and you got 5% of the vote. And you're going to build a coalition with who? Same dynamic. You're going to go into partnership with somebody that you don't like. That's literally how it works. It's completely inescapable if you're talking about electoral politics. And the second point, I just want to add really brief to Button. I have been looking at you know Brazil a lot recently, obviously. And one of the things that the right used in Brazil was they actually leveraged anti-austerity protests in 2013 and turn, and sort of migrated it to a broader, quote unquote, like anti-corruption politics, which was weaponized to only focus on left parties. So this also like free floating, like- Drain the swamp. Drain the swamp, morality, the fucking corruption. It's, it become, it's, it, we already have a case study where it is literally a useful tool of a, a, a fascist movement in Brazil. People, ask me why you think this creates apathy and disempowers the left. Because if you follow this line of thinking to its logical conclusion, you are basically locking yourself in a basement. There is no, there is no, like it's one thing to say, ugh, I had to watch uh, AOC say that she was gonna vote for uh, Andrew Cuomo and support his candidacy in the general. It made me uh, nauseous. We turned into get, a comedy bit. But I get why she's doing it. End of story. But when you basically say that any way that the left empowers itself through electoral politics is inherently corrupt and worth disdain and worth walking away from an indication that nothing will ever good will happen... All you're doing is disempowering the left. That's all you're doing. You're doing nothing else. And it's really, really dangerous if it was to be, uh, you know, bra uh, uh, I I'm not convinced that it's not dangerous now, frankly, in terms of uh, inhibiting the left's ability to do anything. That's the problem with this. That's the problem with it. The analysis is... Uh, now, if this was on... I'm sure there's somebody out there who's saying something similar on, you know, that doesn't have the TYT platform. It didn't have their, uh, their subscriber base, you know, built because they're, you know, uh, you know, originally TYT comedy or whatever it is. Okay. No, I think it's perfectly legit, but I'm just saying like, that's what makes it dangerous. That's why we comment on it because it disempowers the left as much as, uh, you know, the stuff that we see right wingers saying does. In some and, instances, and, maybe more. And at least for me, I'll tip the hat. I think it's also a shame because I do think, you know, I think he's a talented guy. And I think at points he's expressed some good values about things. Bums well, me out, frankly. 
So I have a slightly different take on this that still ends in calling Jimmy Dore an idiot. I didn't call him an idiot. Okay, okay, That's my bad. That's the point That's of not you. raising his name. <laughs> and uh, you. Not you did somehow imply you were siblings at the beginning of the segment, though. You didn't follow up on that. I, didn't, I was No, confused. not that mm. they were siblings, but oh. like, you know, we were in the same. Yeah, in the same. It's like Cain and Abel. Right. <laughs> so. Cain and fucking Abel. Why does he have all the fucking good farmland? Fuck him. <laughs> so, <laughs> Fuck you at the farm. I forgot what I was going to say. No, just kidding. Um, so I am very skeptical of uh, voting in electoral politics as a route to progressive legislation uh, directly. I think uh, the way DSA participates in it is largely a bill sp- base building project, and it has been somewhat successful so far. It's, it's really too early to see if it's actually working the way we want it to. But I think AOC was a very good project for that, and I think uh, like at least... Science show, science point to some good things happening from it. But um, it's just not a very interesting question to me at this point, like whether or not you vote. Like it's kind of ridiculous. Like the way I approach voting is it can't hurt and it might help. You know, like we got to do it, even though we really need to focus on other things, too, like mostly on other things. But it's weird for me to see somebody who claims to be on the far left to be that obsessed with voting in either direction. And I think this isn't it even speaks to a lack of class analysis on Jimmy Dore's part, maybe a lack of strategy. I don't know. Also, we do have things that we criticize her for, right? Like the Bariqua caucus in DSA wrote a letter to AOC because she is very good on Puerto Rico um, and not, not quite as good on Israel. I think she just doesn't know that much about it. They wrote a letter to AOC explaining how these issues are connected and how Israel is also an example of colonialism and how the two-state solution is not a viable solution, right? They wrote this letter to her. She read it. It was a productive conversation. That's not what this is. It's not even remotely like that. Yeah, no. he, he's marshalling these things to argue that her project is doomed from the beginning. Yeah, also, yes, also, that's, that's the that's point. A policy conversation. Exactly. It's totally different. You're trying yeah. to shape certain policy. With him, he's simply saying there is no value to what she's doing. It's, that's, that's, it's completely, it's, it's, it's basically undercutting the entire uh, exercise and trying to force it into that narrative. I really would. Yeah. And, I, I gotta, and look, yeah. if you don't believe that there is any way to get progressive change by getting progressives elected and uh, putting them into office, like what you think that the a specific label on them is going to make a difference? Well, I think like, that's actually like, where Jamie's point really actually underscores how totally incoherent it is. I think any analysis, at least in the current situation we're in, that doesn't somewhat center electoral politics to me isn't valid. Be- just well, most tr- people but don't that being vote. said, that being said, like the idea that you're simultaneously running around talking about like his perspective that he's trying to uh, sort of point to his whole show should just be about like street actions and civil disobedience and other forms of outside of electoral organizing. Because if you have a fatalistic view of Democrats, no matter what happens, which is obviously the brand, then the other thing is, okay, yeah, sure. Let's throw a few votes for some irrelevant party that does nothing, which I'm sorry. That is what the Green Party is. And I don't even see him doing that, at least in the things that we see. I just see him being like, see, this is why AOC well, is he- actually bad. See, this is why you shouldn't actually be excited about the first you know, African-American woman that could be governor of Georgia who actually has a legit, solid center-left record. I just hear... It's inevitable. It will never work. And by the way, did you see that Rachel Maddow said this thing? And it's anti-politics. Yeah, it's... it's yeah. If you want like an internally coherent vision for uh, extra electoral models of change, listen to any anarchist podcast. It's Going Down is a really good one. Uh, occasionally, my show. I don't want to plug it outside the plug time. But, uh, street Fight Radio. Not, yeah, Street Fight. Excellent. Not, not this. It's not this. I mean, the people most skeptical of electoral politics should be the ones who know not to get caught up in this dumb bullshit. Right. But he's not skeptical of electoral politics. No, I know. He's an idiot. No, he's a... <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was going to add another idiot. point, no, but I'm not, sorry. not to the button. He, 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 I, I think we got tricked into doing it so Sam didn't have to is what just happened. Well, him, it's basically like mm. she didn't pick that completely pointless fight that co- would cost her political capital. Right. Of course. 
but also but most- the but the but if you have a different name behind your uh behind your uh on your ballot if it says green all rules of political coalition building and building power just completely fall away you won't have to you're just gonna well, operate hence back to the in europe right you go right. into coalition right. exactly. argument exactly. and ironically for the green party specifically in that process in europe it's actually morphed from like a hippie, hippie kind of lefty party to actually a very centrist kind of like pro market eco one in a lot of places, which is interesting. Uh, let's go to the phones. We call from a three zero one area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hey, is this me? Yes, it is. This is Matt from Maryland. Um, I had something I wanted to say, but first I wanted to uh, give a shout out to Jamie. Her talk about the DSA inspired me to go down to a uh, Mark seminar down in Silver Spring. Oh, hell yeah. And the room was crowded, standing room only. There were 35 people there. It was awesome. I came home and signed up for the DSA. So nice. I wanted to thank you for inspiring me to do that. Hell um, yeah. Well, but did you see what uh, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez said? Oh, yeah. No, now I'm, I'm, I'm tearing up my card. I'm, I'm done. I'm done. I'm sorry. Um, but what I was going to say is... No, wait, Matt, where are you calling from again? Mom. I'm sorry, Maryland? Okay, good. Maryland. Yeah. Uh, I was talking to my mom the other day, and she's a very sort of old school liberal, pretty centrist. I mean, and she her heart's in the right place, but like she's so endemic of so many, especially older white liberals I talk to who sort of fetishize nonviolent movements, ignoring the fact that they were using nonviolence as a means means to power. They ignored the fact that the whole point was to achieve an actualize power instead they just focus on the fact that oh it was so peaceful and they didn't like they they they're terrified of conflict they're terrified of their own shadows yeah i mean i and think that's a big part of, it, i think that's a big part of a large swath of of you know the center to the left yeah like i was talking to my mom about the difference between obama and lbj lbj was kind of a scumbag but he made the bastards deny it you know he he fought hard and he achieved real things and like I said, I said, you know, that's what we need. And she's like, oh, but Obama, he was such a good man and this and that. And, you know, he was this and he called for civility. And I was like, yeah, but he achieved nothing. <laughs> His legacy is gone. I mean, White ladies are so sweet. You need power. And they're terrified of it. I mean, I don't, I mean, I don't think it's right to say that he achieved nothing. I mean, I think like it, it, it appears yeah. for the most part that the at least a big part of the ACA is going to be there. And I think it's going to be much easier now uh, to get. Um, expansion of Medicare and hopefully Medicare for all, uh, because yeah. now you yeah. know. I mean, but but uh, but largely, yes, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Um. I mean, I I remember right after the election, there was you know everyone was trying to form groups. And, you know, we need to fight back. And I went to this one down in, in down nearby where I live, and they're all talking about how they needed to you know help communities of color and this and that. It was all great stuff. Like I agree, we need to help people. But when I brought up, I'm like, you know, the only, like the turnout in our city is like 13 percent, like for local elections. If we like get boots on the ground and go door to door and start busing people like to the polling stations, we could capture all the local government and effect real change. And and somebody stand up and said the dumbest fucking thing I'd ever heard. He said, I think these people have more important things on their mind than winning elections. And I'm like, yeah, but that's why they have these problems. Redlining, like they have no power like they can't solve like the reason why their water shit is because the people who control who gets good water are not them like it's just mind-boggling the myopathy myopathy yeah, yeah. I, I, it's it's difficult to get people to connect what their government does with how it impacts their daily life i mean that's a big challenge yeah it's a big challenge without a doubt Pre- i said i'm sorry but yeah that's that, sorry that was just pretty much what i wanted to talk about because I love that you and especially Michael on his show, which I'm also a, I'm a subscriber to both of you, you both talk about, articulate left politics from a position of power, which is what we need because we haven't had that in like 70 years. And that means we've basically ceded the board to the fucking Nazis. Sorry for the yeah. swear. Well, all right. You're forgiven, Matt. Appreciate the call. So fact check okay. on myself from earlier. <laughs> When I got mad and I said, most people don't vote. Most poor people don't vote. That's what I meant. And a lot of them don't vote because they don't think it's going to make a difference because they've 
suffered under Democrats and Republicans alike. And it's hard to argue with them about that. A lot don't vote because they make it really hard to vote, especially in New York primaries. New York is one of the corrupt, most corrupt states in the country in terms of the Democratic Party machine. Also, there are lots of people who are potential left activists who can't vote because they are undocumented immigrants or because they are convicted felons. So I think any organizing strategy needs to also account for the fact that most working class people don't vote. And there's only so much we can do about that. I mean, there is there's also data that shows that. Um, people on Medicaid, let's say, um, vote a lot less than people not on Medicaid. And part of that is a function of it's difficult to go. It's Tuesday yeah, afternoon. There's gerrymandering. There's, the Voting Rights Act has been gutted. No, all that is true. Um, but the idea is how do you get those people to vote? One, you got to make it easier. You know, there's all sorts, there's judicial, there's reforms, obviously, in terms of like, let's make it a holiday. You don't have to go into work or vote on a Saturday or mail in a ballot or something. Nevertheless, um, there th it's also communicating that it makes a difference. Right? Like you may have more access to health care. Um, it certainly makes a difference in those states that where a Republican governor has said, we're not going to do <laughs> we're not going to expand Medicaid here. You're talking about hundreds of thousands of people in a lot of different states. Uh, Let me do another uh, another Brazil analogy. Brazil has mandatory voting. And one of the things on the docket as part of like a full sort of right wing sort of, you know, destroy workers party privatizes. Let's get rid of compulsory voting. That's right. not very democratic. Of course, that's not very for <laughs> fair to force on people. Uh, and, you know, that structural condition has definitely done something, um, obviously, in Brazil. I, rem I, will, I remember I went to like some type of resistance meeting a couple of days after Trump was elected, and I remember a woman got up and she was like, what we really need to figure out is that Obama and Hillary were so honest with these people that they weren't going to get jobs because their jobs are irrelevant <laughs> now. So we need to figure out, are we going to lie to them? Or do we need to just keep being honest and see if they'll figure it out? And I was like... Uh, <laughs> Trump's going to get reelected. <laughs> uh, let's go to the phone. You call him from a 207 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Is this me? Yes. Uh, this is Josh from Maine. Josh from Maine. Um, I, just to, um, I just want to go back to Jimmy Dore for a second. Like, I think... Um, a person like him who really wants a third party, like you'd think that he'd be focusing more on the state level, trying to build up a grassroots in the state legislatures before trying to bring it to a national stage. Like it seems like, and I'm looking at the Green Party website, that, you know, they run maybe five candidates in a few states, and then every four years they run a presidential candidate, and they're so surprised that they don't get 5% don't get of the vote. Right. Like, if you're going to build a third party, you have to build it from the ground up. You can't just you know, complain that nobody supports it and then don't do anything on the off years to actually build up a base. Uh, yeah. I mean, I totally agree with that. And I think, you know, there's just not a, there's just not the same, um, YouTube, um, you won't be the same YouTube sensation if you just focus on state politics. Do you think anybody at the Green Party got fired for the DSA being the group that took off with grassroots progressive energy and the Green Party is still the Green Party? No. Well, the DSA is not a political party. That said, we do, like a lot of people in DSA, not everybody agrees on this at the moment. We're figuring a lot of things out, but we do want a, a real workers party eventually but we recognize that we need to build this from the ground up before we can even think about it and we are many many years off and you know there's really there's no shortcut there's no substitute for just doing the work the the working families yeah, party no, the working families party is now i think putting um has is is endorsing or is running i should say um the the most amount of people they've ever run i could be a hundred people uh in across like four or five states i mean they're they're actually building now a third party um you know they are fusion party in new york but in other states 
and in New York, in some instances, they've they have run people who um, are uh, are running exclusively on the working families party ballot. Now, you could say like, oh, but I don't like their proposal for X, Y or Z. Right. Like, I don't know how it would match up in terms of the Green Party um, as a party in and of itself. But the question is not their issue set as much as how they're approaching building power. I mean, it's, I appreciate well, the call, Josh. The, Thank you. As I understand it, the Working par- Families Party primarily makes on-paper endorsements. In New York. Yeah. In New York. But they're in f- six other states. So in Connecticut, you can have Working Families Party um, running ex- on their ticket exclusively. They're, and they have resources, without a doubt. Calling from a 267 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hi. Uh, my name's... Hello? Hello. Your name is... Hello. Who? My name is Jeffrey. Hello, Jeffrey. What's Jeffrey. Your name? Jeffrey. Hi, how you doing? I'm Where calling you? from Philadelphia. Okay, Jeff from Philadelphia. Jeffrey. Sorry. Good. How you doing? I just wanted to get some off my chest. I, uh... I've been listening to you guys for a lot, well, you particularly, for a long time since Air America, when you were on with like Chuck D and Rachel Maddow and whatnot. Okay. <clears throat> so a long time. And, uh, you know, I remember when, you know, John Kerry was going to be the savior of the Democratic Party. So that's how far back I go. But okay. uh, I just don't understand. <sighs> I mean, I don't want to be, it's not as you as much as say like, the Young Turks, and, oh, God, I'm not even going to mention Jimmy Dore, but, oh, I mean... Too late. It just, when did the Democratic Party just stop being good enough? I mean, this Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez thing, is, that's lovely, but what does it really matter in the grand scheme of things? She's not flipping a Republican seat. She's not adding to the 218 number. She's one of 435 senators. She'll be a backbencher for two years at House, least, and right? if she dares to go against... The leadership, she'll get stripped of all the committee ships because that's how it works. Right. Because you got to herd cats. That's what it's all about. Right. So I don't understand why I'm supposed to be all that excited. Well, I think the exciting thing about her is that um, she's going in, she's fundraising across the country for more progressive candidates. I mean, if your agenda is to have a Democratic Party that is more progressive, she is attracting. That's not my agenda. My agenda is to have 200. This is not the year for that. That's the thing. That's my problem. My agenda is to have 218, 51, and 26. That's all I care about. Hitler could come back from the dead and run as a Democrat, and I would vote for him if it would mean that we had the majority back because okay. the man has to be stopped. But, okay, okay. This is not the time to run I an understand. agenda. But wait, wait. wait. There wait, is no wait, leader to on. the Democratic Jeffrey, Party, so Jeffrey, who cares what Jeffrey, one... I mean, that's the Jeffrey, thing. There's no Jeffrey, leader, so it's Jeffrey, stupid to put up policy. Jeffrey, let me ask you a question. Let's just start, let's just start at the margins. Who is going to... Who is going to get more Democrats to come out and vote? Hitler or AOC? That's cute. But no, 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 dude. Is, no, dude, I don't, I'm no, not no, really, no. I'm no, not no, really no, sure no, listen, that she's going to get more Democrats to vote than Joe Conley would. Then, then, I don't understand then Joe why Crowley? Joe Conley wasn't good enough. Joe Crowley? I don't understand what was wrong with him. Yeah, Crowley, excuse me. Why don't you ask his I don't understand why he wasn't good enough. He would have gotten just as many Democrats Excuse me. Wait a Either second, way, Jeffrey. You st- will you stop talking Democrat. for a second? Stop it doesn't talk- matter. Jeffrey, stop talking for a second. You asked me a question. Sorry. Let me answer it. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. My I'll mind. tell you why Joe Crowley didn't, uh, w- wasn't going to get more Democrats out than Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez. <laughs> and all I need to do is show you the numbers. He lost. Hear you? He right. lost. She has the ability to bring out more Democrats than Joe Crowley. That's what the election proved. She's I understand going that, to, but if he had won, do you think if he Democrats had won, yes, for her if he had won, for him, if he had won this year, we would not be talking about him. Do I think there's more Democrats in that district who are going to vote for Joe Crowley than AOC? I will bet you every single thing I own that her winning vote tally will be higher than almost any, well, certainly any off-year election. Now, we can't disaggregate but between the way okay, That's going to be the same for everyone. Yes. It's not just going to be her. Exactly. This is a weird exactly, election. Jeffrey. Like, so what like, have we learned? Oh, well, Wait a know, second. Do better. Wait a second. What have we learned? 
that this period of time is actually the best time to get better Democrats in. Because it's I don't cost agree. I don't agree. Free. Not when you risk it's losing. Cost now when you risk free. losing. We just and, and what, what are we better Democrats? Just, what are better you Democrats? just I agreed with me that she is going to get a construction worker excuse who knows me, Jeffrey, nothing about government? Jeffrey. An actress in New York? Are you joking? Excuse me, Jeffrey. You just Those are better Democrats? I don't like what you consider better Democrats. Well, okay, that's the not that's the issue. Okay, that's fine. If you want to disagree with me as to what makes a better Democrat, but you have not a shred of evidence. In fact, you have okay, less fine. than wait, wait, Jeff. Then let's debate that. Then let's All right, debate hold that on, point. Hold I will on. concede I'm that I'm going do to, not have to wait. Let me tell you what the debate is, and then we can debate it, Jeffrey. All right. Oh shoot. Where did he go? You can't. Oh, here. No, I'm going to put him back in. Them. Jeffrey, I didn't hang up on him. Jeffrey, listen. I'm going to bring you back into the queue, but I want you to be quiet, all right? Just just wait until I finish the premise. I'm willing to debate with you what makes a better Democrat. But if you want to argue to me that Joe Crowley will get more votes than Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, we can't test that because he already lost to her. And when I say to you, she's going to get more votes than he has in any off-year election in his history, he was in for 20 years, you say to me, yeah, but they're all going to get that. So if your premise is they're not as electable, you have already disproven that premise. So if you want to argue to me that Andrew Cuomo is a better Democrat, let's say, than Cynthia Nixon, I'm willing to have that argument with you. But don't make it about getting elected because you've already lost that argument. All right, I will concede that point to you. Okay, so <laughs> I'm perfectly willing to. Why say do I wrong. think Cynthia Nixon? But I'm a I do want to. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Why do I think Cynthia Nixon would make a better uh, governor of New York State than Andrew Cuomo? Yeah, Andrew Cuomo is horribly corrupt. <laughs> uh, Andrew Cuomo. He's also horribly qualified. As He's a, also horribly qualified. I, I, I don't know what that means. I mean... What is Cynthia Nixon... What are Cynthia Nixon's qualifications? What will be her first order in office? What does she know about anything other than acting? What was Andrew Cuomo's first office in office? If they're what incompetent, was that can be just as bad as corruption. I don't agree you with you. That? I agree with you. I agree with you. And I think there's definitely a question as to whether or not she has the executive administrative skills to... To do that uh, that job, I think that's a, a valid uh, question. I just think that Andrew Cuomo is, is incredibly a, corrupt and was. I don't agree. From I a don't Democratic agree with perspective, that. I don't agree with your he enabled the Republicans for the last eight years. Are you aware of the IDC? Yeah, because he runs a state that isn't all New York City, and that was that was Cynthia Nixon's big mistake. She ran like she was running for mayor of New York City. Nobody in Schenectady or Lackawanna or Buffalo gives a crap about the New York subway. She system. won in those places. You know, that's and why the she state lost. runs. Uh, I'm sorry, she won upstate. Well, it doesn't matter. She still didn't run. On issues, they may, she may, may have voted I, for her anyway, but she didn't. I, I listened to her, and all her issues were pretty much New York City specific. Her, because she knew and her biggest know, challenge. She was talking about Republican wait, wait, Lackawanna but wait, 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 and excuse Republican me, excuse me. Look at the map. Republican Albany Look at the map. New York City. Look at the electoral map. All right. The reason why Andrew Cuomo won is because he won New York City. Look at the map. All right, fair enough. Not to but mention outspending her eight still to one. valid. She is unqualified to be a governor of a large state. Not to mention the arrogance it takes to say one day, you know what? I'm going to try my foray into politics. You know, politics to be honest with you, at the state the reason why level, she ran, instead of like the state reason why she ran, or Jeffrey, mayor, Jeffrey, or, Jeffrey, the sorry? reason why she ran was because people are trying to prevent Andrew Cuomo from running and being a viable candidate for the presidency. And so she ran, essentially, to win... He will never be a viable candidate for president. I mean, that's ridiculous. Well, you know who thinks you're I'm wrong? Sorry, he won't be. You know who thinks you're wrong? Andrew Cuomo. Yeah, he was liking this call so well, far. Well, that's fine. That's fine, but I'm pretty sure Andrew... Uh, I'm pretty sure uh, Cory Booker's going to be the next presidential nominee from the Democratic Party. Well, so, that's, all right. that's in sure play. That's have, I don't yeah, think that's, guy a, runs that's in not a crazy thing to shovels think. people's driveways. You can't pay for that kind of publicity, so... Right. Sir. 
All right. Well, but I don't understand what your point is. I mean, he's going to be the guy. Uh, well, look, I, my point is, I disagree. But. My point is that suddenly it seems that left wing uh, left wing Democrats have decided that being the left wing version of Trump and putting completely unqualified candidates up for election just because they're a celebrity in her case or they're you know, they have some kind of like or they don't. The, the, of course, the, the the purity test of they don't take corporate money. You know, that well, wait a second. First that's off, a ridiculous first thing. off, Jeffrey, did you really listen to me on Air America? Or are you confusing really me did, with somebody yeah. else? Because I, I wasn't not, on I with you I was not on with Rachel. And the oi, oi, oi show and Randy Rhodes and Mike Malloy and Rachel Maddow and Chuck yeah. D. I was but there. But did you listen Please, to my show? Because all we did yeah. was talk about um, about getting uh, rid of the DLC and getting rid of corporate Democrats. And we got a guy. Do you like John Tester? Yeah, I know John Tester. Do you like John Tester? He's all right. I don't live in Montana, so I don't really know the issues that he deals with there. Okay, well, you don't live in New but York he's either. he's a Democrat, and he problem, votes but... mostly with Democrats, right, and right. that's how government works. Do you know what, you know what so John Tester was doing? You know what John is Tester? Point. Do you know what John Tester was doing when Marcus Melitzis found him as a way of defeating the DLC candidate? He was yeah, sitting he on was a tractor. He was also, yeah, he was. That's fine, but it, oh my god. Also, how <laughs> did you how, think, how's that no, Trump did, strategy really working out that for the GOP? Because one outcome was okay, that it's going to be like that every time. Again, I don't, I don't know. The what guy you mean. in the White House, the guy in the White House, and that just proves your point. So, what are we talking about? Uh, wait, wait, wait. I just saw a poll that said, "Okay, listen, I just saw a poll uh, of uh, Democratic voters that." Voting against Trump is not enough to bring them out. That's now maybe you have different data that's out there. Okay. Yeah. Well, because people who did not all, vote. Listen, all, listen, just listen. First of all, just listen, Jeffrey, Jeffrey, that aren't listen, voting for Trump. I understand. See, and what Jeffrey, you're doing is you're forcing Democrats Jeffrey, to go to those Republicans Jeffrey, instead of pandering to the Bernie bros. No, Jeffrey, listen to me. I don't know what you're talking about. I just told you that people who didn't vote in 2016 are not going to come out to vote, to vote against Trump. Okay, largely. I imagine yeah, there's where are they going to come out to vote for? They're probably no. not going to come out to vote at all. Well, they're just not. I mean, you're arguing. So what is the argument? You're going to get, you're going to get disaffected Republicans to vote? Because you know the reason no, why Hillary lost you're gonna was because push, you're gonna push she underperformed. You're going to push people in Peoria and Democrats there to go hunt for the votes of disaffected Republicans because they're not going to go beg and pr promise crap they can't sell like Medicare for all because they're one person and it takes at least 218 people to pass something like that. Jeffrey, I don't understand what you're I saying. Mean, that's what I'm you're saying. You're saying that people in Peoria shouldn't support Medicare for all and... No, what I'm saying is that the minority party that is running should not be running on policy without a leader to lead it. That's what I'm saying. You can't have Why? 218 people running around all espousing different policies. That's not how it works. Well, I got news for you. you They're all going message. around one right now. Message. Everybody's all... got to get in lines like a dude, duck. Like dude, duck. dude, dude, dude. They're all running on health care right now. They're all running on health care. And how 90... are they going to do that while Trump is president? Why are they running on health care right now? They because be on, all of them see man. their polling. The it worked for the Tea Party. It worked for the Tea Party. They didn't run on anything. They just run on We Hate Obama. What are you talking about? They ran Why wouldn't it on. Work for us? Dude, did you pay attention? They didn't run. They, it's not just they ran on Obama. They ran. The whole Tea Party was started because of the bailouts, because poor people were getting money, because the government, because they ran oh, against, oh, they ran against oh, health care. Oh, 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 oh. right. It started when Obama uh, became the nominee for president, and it was going to be that he but won. But it didn't work the very when first he won, Tea did Party it? rally was didn't. scheduled for inauguration day. It didn't work when Give he won. Give me a break. It didn't work when he was. Yeah, like, that's no. also another good point. Jeffrey, they just, already call people like Nancy Pelosi socialists anyways. It's irrelevant what the policy is. No one's. I got. I got to. I, I got to go, with Jeffrey. Run because its course. because it, hi, I'm Adolf Hitler. You might disagree with me on my previous record. However, I do have executive experience, and I find and Donald Cynthia Trump Nixon, is an asshole. Cynthia, Donald Trump is an asshole, and Cynthia Nixon is absolutely outrageous in attempting to lead without experience. It is time that we have a leadership that has put in the time. You know, 
You know what's nice about... You know what? They got that saying. The trains ran on time. I mean, come on. You know what's nice about this rising wave of left populists, progressives, democratic socialists, or whatever you want to call them. They want to give that guy health care, too. Yeah, I, I just... I don't. I would I, actually write a special There's just a, a, a lack of understanding deprive. what's what going on. What was that guy's name The again? vast majority... He doesn't get health care. The overwhelming majority of Democrats running successfully to the extent that we have polls for every race out there. We don't. But successfully, they are running on health care. That is, when you look at the success that Democrats have had in the special elections, health care was the overwhelming issue that they ran on. If Cynthia Nixon began running as a state rep, I would respect this. I, However, I would agree that I would not, if I was Cynthia Nixon, I wouldn't have focused so much on the subways. I would have gone more for corruption. I would have gone for uh, broader issues earlier. But that's a different question. Um, and just... It's I, so I think obvious, though, that she stepped on a grenade for us. There was no other candidate. Like, this is actually, if anything, the best way to look at Cynthia Nixon is she was a noble citizen activist absolutely who did a massive amount to you know we always say destroy the idc essentially which has major implications for the state and andrew cuomo he took her a lot more seriously than the caller did because he was out spinning and trying to reinvent yes. himself actually by the way going back to bernie sanders in 2016 was when cuomo started to try to pivot when that guy got elected governor i do remember his first order of businesses at least as far as i know it was cut taxes for millionaires Definitely. and cut school funding. Yep. And privatized schools. And Com I would add, competent. the reason why Cynthia Nixon ran is because no politician in New York would run against Cuomo. There wasn't one. That's why she ran. And it was the same in 2014. Bill de Blasio wouldn't even formally endorse her. Like, that's another thing that people need yeah, to, I think, really get through their hates head. hates Cuomo. Yeah, de Blasio and Cuomo are enemies. They have a, a... Cuomo's tried to undermine them every step of the way. They have all sorts of, you know, rivalry. And, and de Blasio's big, like, F you was, I'm staying neutral, let alone not having the chutzpah to run against him. Cynthia yeah. Nixon had to do that. <laughs> I, I, like, I, I mean, if she didn't do that, like you would be the other person on the list. And I don't mean that like as an insult. I mean, literally, like literally. there isn't a list. Literally. Yep. I wrote about this in my op-ed for NBC. Like there were so, so many factors that raid against her winning. She was never going to win. And that's not what this was about. But the idea that there's to make an argument that trying to get the most progressive candidates is going to hurt these candidates based upon zero data. In fact, all the data is running against that. I'm not saying that um, Heidi Heitkamp should be out there saying, well, I think she should talk about expansion of Social Security and, frankly, um, you know, uh, some expansion uh, improvement on health care. They've but been hitting the health care, the, um, uh, the lawsuit Trump admin has to take away the mandate or what is it about? To, to, to take away not just the mandate, but also the pre-existing conditions. Right, the pre-existing conditions. And Heidi Heitkamp has been running on that. Yeah, she's been okay. hitting that for a while. Heidi Heitkamp. Now, Jeffrey in Philly may know better than Heidi Heitkamp what's going to work in North Dakota even though he doesn't seem to know about what happens in Montana. But um, Heidi Heitkamp understands. I mean, healthcare has been running, and it's, it's not to privatize the system more. It is, she's from, when she talks about the idea that they would roll back pre-existing conditions, that is promoting the regulatory state, the, and what folks like Bernie and AOC have done is, they have moved the conversation as to what is mainstream. They have moved it to the left. That is just the reality. They, they weren't the only people. It was happening at the end of the Obama administration, too, where you had the full complement of Senate Democrats come out and vote for expansion of Social Security, which was a huge turnaround from just eight years earlier, five years earlier, four years earlier. But it accelerated with Bernie. And so that's where the value is. Now, if you th and if all and if all you care about is getting Democrats in there to defeat Trump, which I agree with, which is why AOC, didn't, you know, said I we've got to get Andrew Cuomo elected and every other Democrat on the ticket elected. 
because she also knows that when people go out and vote for Cuomo, they go down the list and they check off D, D, D down in Congress, too. Right. That's just the way that people vote. We're going to need to vote for Adolf Hitler. If you have a problem, if you have a problem with specific issues, but you're trying to argue that Democrats are going to lose because they're moving left and there's no data to support that argument at all. All we have is the data that we've seen it working across the state. In fact, the only major loss that we can point to in the special elections is down in Georgia with Ossoff. And he had the same consultants that basically, I think, um, uh, picked every other loser around, which was ride the center. Also, this guy said it in more intense terms than I ever would have. But like, if you're if Democrats are winning by running Hitler, like, what is the point of having Democrats win? Like, what what do you get from that? Yeah, I mean, I have to concede on that point. I, I would say that if Hitler that that's a. I'm pretty strong on this lesser of two evils and party block voting thing. But well, I'm we gonna, don't I'm know who Hitler's the, running against. It that's could be, true. Hitler could be running against double Hitler. Ooh, mm. That's exactly it. Right? Yeah, it could be running against Steve King in Iowa, in which case I'd vote for Hitler. <laughs> I prefer a, a little bit of European flair in my white supremacy. Call him from a 5112 area code. This is Jay from Austin, Texas. All right, you get a bad uh, phone number. I mean, a bad phone, Jay, so uh, got to be quick. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, uh, a lot of things have actually been said from my original question that I wanted, but I guess I'll just kind of touch on what, what I've been hearing. I'm, I'm somebody that did, that did not vote in 2016, and it wasn't like a um, – it wasn't like a – contest kind of thing or, or, or a protest like I, like i'm not voting for this person because i don't like either candidate um it was more about i had warrants and i didn't want to go into uh the dps and register and get taken to jail whether or not that is an actual reality and that would actually happen I, i'm not too sure i did see that happen to somebody when i was renewing my license one time somebody tried to go in and do the same thing they tried to register to vote and it showed that they had a warrant so they got they got taken to jail um, so I was always kind of worried about that and that's specifically why I didn't vote. But to that, to, uh, I guess Jeff's point, or I guess your point, I will be voting. I've already registered to vote. I got my warrant taken care of. Um, but I, I specifically registered to vote to, um, get the Trump administration and, and essentially the Rep- Republican party out. Um, so that's, that's the first thing that I wanted to say, cause I'm, I am somebody that did not vote in 2016, but I, I did certainly register to vote. Um, and will be voting. And a lot of it has to do with Beto here in Texas. But now, Jay, um, Jay, but, uh, if, 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 uh, if Beto was, I mean, could Beto be too progressive for you to vote for him? I know you come from Austin, so maybe this is not uh, the, the <laughs> best. But the, the point is, is that if you like, you really don't like uh, Donald Trump. Is there anybody out there like I wonder what it is that Jeffrey thinks would keep someone who really doesn't like Donald Trump? from voting maybe you know uh, maybe if you're running for uh congress in the suburbs of philadelphia you don't want to talk about uh expropriating uh you know uh private residences but uh, i mean beyond that like i wonder what it would be that people would 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 not vote for a democrat uh if they were inclined to vote against trump here in texas well, in Texas, yeah, but I don't see people pressuring, like, you know, Beto, uh, Rourke, I, I mean, you know, he's not, a, I don't think he's, I think he's a lot less progressive than he is pitching, but he finds it uh, in his sure. benefit to present that way, which also cuts against uh, Jeffrey's argument. Um, I think he's going to be a lot less progressive when he's, when he's voting, but um, I think it's, he knows that it's getting the base out is the key. Getting all those mm-hmm. activists to go and work for him is the key. Right. Well, I think I think a large part of this, and, and my name's Trey, by the way, and I and and I had called a few weeks ago, and I had spoke spoke to you about 
um, the importance of education and how teachers don't really um, appropriately teach the classes. I think that has a lot to do, again, with um, people not voting because they don't understand how the, the levers of, of the political system work. Cause it's just not taught to them. So not only do they not understand about voting itself <laughs> um, and going in and what that means, but they don't, number one, they don't see that it does anything because on top of that, um, any, any person that works in government here is going to try to make any government job or any government, um, you know, like, like health and human services, they're going to make those things really difficult to deal with so that way it plays into the narrative of government does not work. So I think all of those combined is why people don't vote. I mean, I don't think it's because um, it's a protest thing. I, I, I really don't. Um, um, but I, I really do think it just comes down to, to the educational part. But here's, I really quick, I just wanted to get this question out. I, me, and, me and a friend were having a debate, and we were talking about the, the Kavanaugh uh, testimony and the hearing. And he said it doesn't matter if Kavanaugh's in, because if we get the Senate back, we can, we can essentially um, kind of, I guess the Senate or the House can put in more um, Supreme Court justices, basically just kind of making it to where we could have more Democratic ones, if you will. Um, I just wanted to see if that was if there was any truth to that, because he was well, telling me not to be worried about it, even if well, he was no. getting in, because we could. Well, listen, the uh, FDR tried a court packing scheme, right? There is nothing in the Constitution that says there has to right. be nine justices. It could be 11, it could be 10, it could be, you'd want it, obviously, an odd number. Um Right. It is, um, I think it's good to promote that idea. I would like to see probably, I think, a um, doing term limits is a more um, durable reform for the Supreme Court. But it is. it would not be easy whatsoever to expand the Supreme Court. Too many... Too many people who get elected would be too nervous. Yeah, no, I, I we should be yeah. worried about Kavanaugh. I, I mean, I think that they're going to get they're going to fill this vacancy no matter what. But getting the Democrats in the right, Senate, he was trying to be overly positive, and I was, that's something just personally I don't even like. So that that was part of it. But he was just telling me that um, you know don't worry about it. We're going to be able to put in more justices and. I just, yeah, I thought no, that that was kind of probably not. Crap. But maybe, but it's certainly worth agitating. Appreciate the call, Trey. Cool, Jimmy Dore's a moron. Okay, well, come on now. I'm really going to pretend like I'm offended by that. Uh, let's go to the uh, IMs. I love Sarah Palin. Trump isn't going to fire Rosenstein today. If he would have, he would have done it on Twitter, not in person. Um... On that caller's point, you hope AOC will galvanize people and especially young people outside her district to get involved and come out to vote. If you're like me and thinking any blue will do, and it is much more difficult to get poor people and older uh, first-time voters to vote, you should be happy she's a national figure. Exactly. The easiest way to win elections for the left is to engage young people. Right now, older people are, are going to come out and vote. I don't know. I saw some figure, maybe 75%, and uh, younger people, 35%. Older people tend to vote Republican. Younger people tend to vote Democratic. Someone like AOC and progressives are going to drive the younger vote. That's just the reality. And you could say they're never going to vote, but old people are not changing uh, their mind about who they're voting for. Not in any meaningful way. God, I'm such an electoral skeptic. And then we get a, when we get a call like Jeff from Philly, I just line Right up behind AOC and Bernie. Rob Morrow. Hey, uh, yeah. Hey, Sam. So my career's been going well lately. Have you seen Billions? It's great. Anyway, I'd like it to continue. So I retained Ed Whelan to help me through some of the Me Too allegations, which we expect to come out soon. Uh, soon. Sorry, bud. I, I don't get it. Sean. I mean, I, I get the idea of Rob Morrow, but Sean, uh, this is my, t uh, my tweet to Miss Sosa. Gina Sosa, I would like to state on the record that I have never raped a girl at any point in my life, let alone when I was 17. None of my friends have ever raped anyone. What values are you teaching your children if you think rape by a 17-year-old is permissible? JJ Cool, what are the MR team thoughts on the military parade attack in Iran? Yeah, we were talking about this a little bit um, before the show, but there's not a lot of, of time. But uh, Michael was saying that uh, probably MEK... Well, now that ISIS has claimed uh, responsibility and there's another uh, sort of 
Arab separatist group that's claimed responsibility. It's really murky. But if the Iranians have blamed an outside force, they're probably implying that the Saudis or the Gulf or the United States support these kinds of groups. And uh, I thought initially if you said Israel, so I thought MEK because the United States uh, and Israel actually have connections to MEK. But when I mean, they were assassinating nuclear scientists, those were MEK operatives, I think, with Israeli support that did that. So this isn't like, uh, and, and it's just, it's very ironic because it's like Iran ironic. is coming out. I, yes, sure. Take it. Ironic. Yeah. They're saying that. Ironic. And they're, and then, and the United States is basically saying, look in the mirror, which I think is a direct quote, I either from Haley or Pompeo. And it's like, oh, I guess we're taking blowback uh, seriously all of a sudden when it involves a, a, you know, attack on a military parade, which I think also killed a little girl. Uh, dark matter, uh, F J D F your with your soul with Seder zero podcast the king you know some Gorsuch across the belly game I prove you lost already. M F -er, I want more iced tea. That's very impressive, the ether. I, I I'm not even sure I follow that. I think that I'm sure that was part of the intention of that tweet. Hif, uh, uh, hi-fi pizza. Matt is wearing a majority report cap. How can we buy this swag? That is old school. That is that I, 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 there's only one or two of those left. Yeah. I didn't even notice it until like a few weeks ago on the top of the bookshelf. Yeah. Those are, that's like a, that's like almost like a museum piece. Uh, Winnipeg Craig. Every time, uh, Jimmy Dore does one of those incoherent argument videos, I imagine Woody Allen, Marshall McLuhan scene, but with Sam getting Noam Chomsky to tell Jimmy Dore off. Chappie, because we're not a parliamentary style government, we, don't we need to create coalitions before the election because of winner take all? Yeah. Leon Gittins. Hi, Sam. So I spent the day at the Labor Party conference in Liverpool. Incredible energy enthusiasm for Corbyn's vision for the future. Policies like giving 10% of corporation shares automatically to its workers as well as workers on the board. Taking the railways, electric gas, utility companies back into public ownership and many more great policies. But the one, but the big one was the second referendum offering the public a vote on the final Brexit deal. This could be a game changer and could possibly reverse this crazy decision. Bring on the red wave, Leon of London and Liverpool. Meta flight. Uh, new research by the Fabian Society in the UK shows from 05 to 17, labor lost around 3.5% of their vote in working class seats. Labor holds and gains 10 point percentage points in middle class suburbs surrounding London. Corbyn's unapologetic left politics are allegedly supposed to turn out the white working class, but it's actually turning out the middle class if anything, it looks like it's easier to convince a middle-class young suburbanite to support worker ownership than get a middle-aged white traditional working-class person to tolerate a firm act. Yeah, right-wing populism is real and it's complicated. A penny for your thoughts. Hi, Sam. I sent an email many weeks ago that I accidentally removed my MR from iTunes and have since been able to get the membership version again, even though I have for years prior. Please advise. Um, sign into your membership. And uh, at um, um, on the uh, log, log into the membership on the website and you will get your RSS feeds there. Send another email at Majority Reporters and just uh, put in the subject line, Hi, Sam. So I'll look through a bunch of those that we get. Hi. Hey, Square. Uh, Sam, so glad you made that point. Uh, Chris, last week I was set up to create a certain image to counter the sexual assault and harassment allegations. It's all looking real sleazy in the way they're setting this woman up and cut her uh, up and shame her. I wonder how young, younger women will react to this spectacle. I don't think I can live uh, through Anita Hill again. Hope the Dems have some tricks ready. Uh, that door clip, so dangerous and reckless. I'm done with these people. All right, we have time for one more call. Calling from an 864 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hey, this is Lori calling from South Carolina. Hello, Lori. What's on your mind? Um, well, first I just wanted to say that I've been a big fan of both you and Jimmy Dore for a long time. But back before the election, I felt like you were being a little... I don't know, difficult to listen to. So I stopped listening to you, and I kept listening to Jimmy Dore. But then, after the election, about halfway through last year, 
I realized Jimmy Dore is a fucking idiot. So I had to stop listening to him. And then I came back around to the loving arms of Majority Report, mm-hmm. and I've been so happy to be back here. But my question is, does anybody there know or anybody out there know has Jimmy ever actually acknowledged the fact that if we were under a uh, Clinton presidency, that things would be better today? Has he ever said that 13,000 plus children being locked up or the fact that women are probably going to lose our sovereignty over our own bodies or the fact that ICE is terrorizing brown people, or the fact that our relationships overseas that were already tentative are being, like, torn to shreds. Has he ever acknowledged that it would be better under a Clinton presidency? Uh, no. I mean, I don't know for a fact, but I would be surprised. No, he minimizes the difference between the Trump and Obama administrations on all those things. Yeah, and, I mean, look, they're... um, I mean, uh, Trump is in some instances horribly worse in other instances, uh, marginally worse. Um, but I don't know that there's an area, I mean, you know, wealth inequality, for instance, used to be a big issue, uh, that I used to hear a lot about, but we don't hear that much anymore. Well, certainly this tax deal, um, and it certainly grew under, uh, Obama without a doubt, but yeah, so no, well, let me just ask you this. And I don't want to get too deep into this, but I, I would be lying if I if I said I didn't uh, quite enjoy it. What uh, what was it that made you what was the final straw? I mean, that um, made you realize that you had made a fatefully wrong mistake in the run up to the election. Um. You mean as far as deciding to listen to Door over MR? No, I mean uh, what, that that made you realize yes. like uh, the mistake that you had made in listening to Door. Well, oh, I didn't make a mistake. I, I live in South Carolina, and I knew we were going to go for Trump. Um, if there was a chance, I absolutely would have voted for Clinton. But as it was, I voted for Stein. Um, if I if we lived in an area where there was a possibility like a sliver of a possibility i absolutely would have voted for. no but i'm asking you what what point did you uh realize that like uh you you uh, jimmy was not up to snuff and you you decided to oh okay well when he kept denying that there was anything going on kept saying russia's a nothing burger like i i was like okay uh that's not that's obviously not true so i just I've been really frustrated with TYT as a whole. I've been a member for a long time, and lately, uh, I, I'm canceling my membership this month, actually. Um, uh, we're already Patreons of the TMBS show, and we're going to transfer our funds to support the Majority Report. So we're really happy to do that. And <laughs> Fucking corporate sellout. One last thing that I wanted yep. to point out is back in the day, Jimmy's whole routine used to be making fun of both sides do it. Like, uh, I forget that dumb reporter's name who was young. Uh, he just used to make fun of how both sides do it, both sides do it. And now it's like that's all he does is both sides do it. I feel like that is his his mantra now i could be a little bit off but i think you're pretty struck me that i think you're pretty close i mean mean, there's there's um i think we've made it clear like there's there's problems with uh, the the democratic party and there's some democrats that i think are you know horrible um but uh i will take the lesser of two evils at all time because my goal is to have less evil and so exactly uh, because now we really are going to be fighting to get back decades of progress so, uh, yeah i thanks I so agree. much thank you Lori. appreciate the call you know we drag on jimmy door on the antifada too just so you know oh. <laughs> there you go all right uh the one that that's matters it. is me i'm the only one that matters <laughs> All right, we will. Uh, we are. I'm sorry, we are out of time in terms of calls. I'm going to go through some IMs here. Uh, A square. Oh, we got that. Obot. 
So Ted Cruz running against Beto is a Medicare for all advocate by casting him as a civil libertarian. He's literally tweeting and paying money to run ads of Beto vocally defending the first, fifth and 14th Amendment and the radical idea that deadly criminal home invasions are bad. The clips have no other context. I just saw the Beto footage. The rugged individual Lone Star State grew I uh, grew up in is now fascist. Also, the only takeaway from the Rosenstein and New York Times story should be a decise, dissecting of why Rob thinks the president is so unfit. It would only take a couple of wiretaps to defend removing him from office. Uh, JB Upstate. Um, caller Jeffrey coming off a bit sexist. Dostoevsky. Can you hung up on this guy? I don't want to dis listen to this dude scream for 20 minutes. Chris Lepako. Didn't Cynthia Nixon push Cuomo to back legal weed and a higher minimum wage? Yes. I'm not an expert on New York politics, but that would seem better than having a challenger like her made him a better Democrat. Yes. Do you think Donald Trump will go through uh, with his creepy mass test message in on October? Uh, yes. He just texts yes. his cue to everybody's phone. Oh, <laughs> genius. Uh, Unfair. Another side, dude, acting is an effing job, you jackass. The qualification for most offices are age and citizenship. F these people that cede leadership to politicians. He's qualified. I'm qualified. You're probably qualified, Jeff, you effing boot licking. Uh, train boy, gotta love Philly Jeff. Voting for Hitler to own the right wing is the 2018 version of voting for Clinton is voting uh, out of fear. It'd be so, you know, like Hitler, like in joining us again on this MSNBC segment, Adolf Hitler and Steve Schmidt. We're talking about these right. latest revelations <laughs> of a text message between Omarosa and Don Jr. <laughs> well, what does this show? Just more incompetence. So it's a, I mean, it's a, you know, th this is an administration that doesn't respect the values that it campaigned on. <laughs> I never treated vermin like that. Never. 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 Pride of the proletariat. It was a degree of competence. Uh, to quote Liz Bruning on preferring a qualified corrupt Cuomo over Cynthia Nixon, F that guy. Uh, Attorney Andrew, that John Aravosa's call just now was something. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to remind him that Andrew Cuomo's qualifications prior to becoming a governor was being the son of a governor. Well, he was at HUD. He also worked for Trump. Because he was the son a of a governor. Is that right? Yep. Yeah, he's palled around with some very bad oh, yeah. folks. Oh, yeah. Doe. Instead of a Republican chosen prosecutor to question Ford and Kavanaugh, it would seem more fair and effective to have someone with expertise in sexual abuse get to the truth. Oh, yeah. They don't want that. How many times did Kavanaugh say that he fed the, uh, the homeless with Father Frank? Too many. Dick Crab, you guys are really entertaining an argument from a guy who said he would vote for Hitler as long as he has a, a D next to him. Like, really? Angel, Sam, my father and I were having a lively discussion about politics last night. Long story short, he's a Republican mainly because he doesn't want his taxes raised. He's not racist or homophobic or religious. In fact, it reminds me a little of you, so I can't understand why he votes Republican. When I tried to tell him that Republican leaders are lunatics, he asked me to name one law that proves their racism. He doesn't accept that voter ID laws are proof of Republican racism. What? I mean, courts have found that. And I couldn't think of any other laws that were examples. What do you recommend as a definitive proof of Republican lunacy? I would say that if your father-in-law needs an explicit law, aside from their assault on repealing parts of the Voting Rights Act that were specifically prohibiting states that had been priorly proven as changing their votes, uh, their, their voting laws with racist intent. I, I would suggest that like, um, I, I don't know if there are laws per se, but I would suggest that like Jeff Sessions saying that we're never going to bring the civil rights division into your police department uh, to scrutinize how you're treating uh, black people as opposed to white people is indicative of racism. I would say the rejection by federal courts on multiple occasions of the Muslim ban was examples of racism. I would suggest that all in totality, the immigration policies of, of the Trump administration, not just illegal immigration, but w and we didn't get to it today. We will get to it uh, later this week of 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 making it harder for legal immigrants to get green cards to uh throwing out of the country legal 
refugees. Coincidentally, the overwhelming majority of those people thrown out of the country were um, people of color. Are indications of the um, of their racism. I uh, I think you can find the fact that in the whole crop, the record breaking crop of Democrats who are running for office, not a single Nazi amongst them. Well, it's like Upton Sinclair said, you know, uh, a man is very good at not knowing things if his uh, salary depends on him not knowing it. And I think that might be what's going on with dad. Yeah, what? I think so. What? We got this uh, clip from Spy Magazine, November 1986. Uh, yeah, it says, unfortunately, Andrew Ratface Andy Cuomo, the governor's capo, looks like a hood. He is not a hood. He is just an ordinary 28-year-old Manhattan lawyer who, surely because of his legal skills and not because he is the son of a governor, has attracted casino operator Donald Trump and, another New and other New York developers as clients. There you go. Ratface like Andy. Mm, is that, that was a great magazine. Wow. That was a great magazine. <laughs> Denver Dave. Sam, you gave Jeffrey way mu too much time, airtime and latitude. Obnoxious New Yorker much? He's from Philly. <laughs> Listening to Jeffrey talk about Piero was dumber than his New Yorker filibuster. But Sam, Hitler had mad skills, so way better than Nixon. The DX full, Shalom. I think Republican voters on CNN would enjoy the new Norm MacDonald show on Netflix. AKA the Adam Sandler channel, since he said people should feel so sorry for Louis C.K. and future Israeli Roseanne Barr. You know whose fault it is? Frank Stallone. <laughs> Thames Darwin. I need to call out my Philly bro, Jeffrey. Corruption's far worse than a lack of experience. An experienced person can surround himself with experienced people and become smarter. A corrupt person just digs deeper and deeper hole till they can't climb back out or their paymasters pull the plug. Oh, that's ridiculous. Bull Prague, remember this, righteous lefties. If your team loses in the primary, you can't and shouldn't vote in the general. Otherwise, you're just another sellout. Hashtag sh uh, show Jimmy the door. In the sticks, Tester in Montana will be running in healthcare and how rural healthcare will be affected with Medicare expansion is killed and pre existing conditions are taken away. Uh, Medicaid expansion is killed. He's also running on his trade war debacle because he's an actual effing farmer, y'all. He's not running against Trump, he's running to help Montanans. Wendy, do you think Rosenstein refused to resign this morning? I do, yes. Jeffrey. Hi, I'm Jeff. I'd rather vote for Hitler than see the Democratic Party become progressive. And the final I am of the day. Tom Cat. I was going to take the plunge and become an MR member and TM Best patron this week. However, that debate has a depressing lack of hey, 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 shut up. And now I'm having second thoughts. Can you guys change my mind and compel me to sign up? Cheers. Love you guys. Really. Hey, 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 shut up. There you go. All right, folks. See you tomorrow. It might take all the strength I got To get to where I want But I know somehow I'm gonna get there I wasn't looking when I just got caught Between the truth and the light bar But finding out won't make me feel any better yeah, I know the clock is ticking, but the meds are gonna kick in, and my pilot light shining bright. I guess I'm where the choice was made, for the option where you don't get paid, for the road that bends before it finally breaks you. I guess somehow I lost my drive 